Good morning, San Diego. Oh, there we go. I'm live. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone that's watching. Um, my name's Kieran, uh, drummer, part-time guitarist, teacher, ex-music uni student, I guess. Uh, I'm going to have a potential two-hour chat today about just like music uni and the experience of doing that, uh, why I did that, uh, and some of the stuff I got out of it. So that's kind of how it links to, I think the title of this was Further Music Education and DIY Touring. So uh, I guess um, the DIY Touring part of it came out the back end of my degree um, is something, it was like my big final project. Uh, <laughs> I suppose the first thing I should probably say is just um, a little disclaimer that obviously my personal experience of university is is different to everyone else's. Um, some people have a great time, some people think it sucks and drop out in six months, um, especially given the current kind of year that we've had, um, universities are kind of been thrown into turmoil. So uh, yeah, take everything I say with a pinch of salt because I'm a bitter, bitter human and uh, <laughs> quite jaded, jaded about a lot of things. So that's that. Um, the first thing, the first thing I wanted to talk about really is just, um, also excuse the drink, it's really cold here. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about is just, is it right for me? Um, so I know a lot of people, um, especially those that are probably at Alton College or just any level of kind of sixth form and are considering, um, uh, considering university like especially going down the music path for university um is it right for you um i guess there's there's a few things to consider and i suppose the big thing to consider is why why you're going um there are plenty of reasons for plenty of reasons against going to um study at conservatoire level or just a like a degree level um and really i suppose the the main things that I got out of it and the reason why I chose to do it was because um, it, it's kind of like a, a, what's the right word? It, it like kickstarts what you want to do um, in terms of music very quickly. Um, you can definitely get all of the experience of like that university experience not not doing it you know just in the real world gigging and all that sort of stuff uh, you have to be a lot more proactive about what you're doing you can't just sit at home and hope you start getting gigs um, but uh, yeah I think one of the big things that you that I got from it anyway is that um, well, first is first, you're surrounded by a community of musicians instantly. You know, you're dumped into a pool of anywhere between kind of 50 to a couple of hundred, maybe even a couple of thousand musicians, all in one very intense bubble. And you will spend, you know, three to four, five years just playing um, loads of different kinds of music with loads of different musicians, loads of different people. Um, so, yeah, that's that's kind of a a, a big thing of, of why I chose to go is because I wanted to, basically, I wanted to get shit out of the drums. Uh, I wanted to meet a load of people, and I wanted to move to a city because I didn't live in a city. Um, and I live in Manchester, so it's a pretty big music city. Uh, yeah, like I say, you can definitely achieve all of those things by not, going to music uni, you, you know, everything, every famous musician that anyone's ever heard of, almost all of them didn't study at a conservatoire or didn't, uh, you know, Bruce Springsteen didn't go to Berkeley. <laughs> uh, but, but then, you know, it's, if you're not going to go to university, it's about going and finding all of those experiences for yourself. 
So go and join a bunch of bands or start a bunch of bands. Uh, you go down local jam nights, all that sort of stuff. Uh, or you know, if you're if you're not a kind of band centered musician like a drummer or a guitarist, if you're I don't know a horn player, a violin player, go find your local brass band orchestra. Go just like getting involved in the local community um, is super important and. And just going to university, I think uh, you're kind of paying for that community of people that you know are of a certain standard, rather than just like Dave down the pub that plays guitar. <laughs> um, okay, cool. That's that covered. Uh, also, if there's any questions any time through this, just uh, do it in the uh, which side will it be? That side, I think. No, that side. Some comments in the in the YouTube stream, uh, and I will be reading them and can answer any questions people have. Um, so, once you've decided you want to go to uni and study music, good for you. Well done. Um, <laughs> and it is a big first step. It's a big first step. Um, it. One of my tutors told me something quite interesting a few years ago that it's. You're already um, uh, taking a massive step by deciding, okay, I want to pursue music because you're you're willingly jumping into a career that has no steady income, no kind of support systems. Really, you know, you don't have medical care or anything. Um, it's certainly taxing mentally. Uh, it can be taxing physically. Um, uh, you're having to deal with all different kinds of people, all different ages and backgrounds all the time. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a weird realm of self-employment. So by taking that first step, you've already made uh, a massive, massive life, life choice by choosing that. Um, so why hold back on anything you do after that? You know, don't settle, um, essentially. Uh, so yeah, if you make the choice to go to music uni, make the most out of it. Don't don't get there and then not go to lectures and spend your time hungover in bed. Because I know people that have done that and they're fine. You know, they're good musicians, they're lovely people, but they probably could have made more of the four years of study than they did. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, let's talk about applying. So, obviously, applications for universities at the minute are a bit different because, well, for most music courses, depending on what the course is, unless it's like a production thing or a composition thing, if you're going in as a player, you will have to showcase some form of playing, obviously, because they want to know that you can play to a certain standard. Um, I think some university degrees, not conservatoire ones, just request you have a certain uh, like some achievement. So it might be like a grade eight in your instrument, a grade five in music theory, uh, and like an A level in some form of music, whether it be like technology, classical music, jazz, whatever. Uh, in fact, across the board, that's kind of a uh, a level that universities are at least like the minimum they're expecting. So if you can't play to that level, if you don't have that level of uh, theoretical knowledge, then you're going to find the first year at least of, of your, you know, it's just, you're going to find that first year hard essentially because you will, A, you will be in a room of people that do have that knowledge and B, you will be expected to, you'll be building upon that, okay? So if you've got, say, grade eight in base, whatever, then they're not going to be teaching you that same crap. They're going to expect to push you beyond that level of playing ability. Um, so if you can't already hit that, um, yeah, it's going to be a hard first year. Not to say that you can't do that and that I haven't seen people that, don't do that. Um, you know, grades by no means are any marker of a good musician. <clears throat> but it's just a helpful thing 
um, it's like applying for a job. You know, people want to see that you've got your whatever your GCSEs and your A levels, and that you can do this and do that. They they just want uh, something, a bit of paper that says, okay, yeah, you can do this thing. Um, but then a big part of the application process for unis, uh, for conservatoires especially, is um, that you have to go in and do a performance. Now, I'm not 100% how that's changed over the last year with COVID. Um, I imagine a lot of it has now become digital submissions, um, <clears throat> which does make stuff, it makes the application not harder, just different. Um, but I know like most universities are trying very hard at the minute to stay open. Uh, so um, I imagine maybe they'll figure out some way of opening up those application processes for people coming in. It kind of depends on the place that you're applying to, to be truly honest. I'm not entirely sure. But <clears throat> when I did my application, at least, uh, I... Yeah, I just signed up for the day, uh, and what did they ask me to prepare? They asked me to prepare the... Okay, so I go to the RNCM, Royal Northern College of Music, up in Manchester, or I did, I should say, finish now. Um, and when I applied, they asked me to prepare uh, one piece of my own, uh, and then one piece that they gave me, uh, which was... Rosanna by Toto, uh, and then, and then I had to do some like on the spot stuff that I couldn't really prepare for. Uh, so the piece I did as my choice was not necessarily a very drummy thing. I think this is where a lot of people get really bogged down in the application process is thinking that they have to do like the most technical shreddy kind of up tempo, whether it's like some bebop thing or some mad dream theater shit um like i played a foo fighters tune if you ever listen to a foo fighters tune the drums are not complicated it's like for like four minutes but i did that with conviction and i think that's it's it's dependent on what sort of course you're applying for um so i went and studied on a popular music performance course. Um, if you're going for something more like a jazz-centered course, uh, I know some guys that have, that went to Guildhall and uh, Trinity and uh, Royal Academy in London. And so if you're going to go for like a more jazz or classical-centered course, like basically if you know what you're going for, look, look at what they are asking of you. Um, if you're going for a jazz course, you know, it may sound dumb, but learn some standards. Learn learn some standards in a, in and get comfortable with ones that you like, I think is important. Um, you know, you don't have to show off at all. Um, the the uh, like the the guys, the the people. Sorry, not the guys, because uh, that's sorry. the people that will be assessing you are obviously going to be like amazing musicians, or well, they usually are. Um, and so you you're not going to impress them or blow their minds by shredding or doing any crazy chopsy stuff because they've seen it all before. You know, they've had hundreds of students come through the college and do exactly the same thing. Um, what they want to see is not so much that you're like an amazing player there and they want to just like scoop you up and and be like, oh, cool, okay, this guy's great on keys. Um, let's have him. What they want to see is that you've got the potential and the drive to be better. Um, and I know that's quite a hard thing to quantify, but uh, that is a lot of the assessment process at these kinds of places. It's very subjective. There's nothing kind of uh, set in stone. You know, it's not like mathematics where it's like one plus one is two. There's none of that. It's, you know, how you come across. Um, yeah, so 
picking picking a piece of music that you can get emotionally invested into, I think, far surpasses something that you think looks impressive. Um, because at the end of the day, the real thing that people connect with in music is the emotional connection, you know. Um, so that's, I think that's, you, you know, if you can play off of that, you'll probably do far better. Um, but again, like I say, it depends on the course. Um, if you're going for more classical, you know, if you're, say, a French horn player or something, um, I don't know entirely the process. But again, like, you, it's the same sort of thinking. You don't have to pick something that is just a page, a black page of a million dots. You can pick a piece you really enjoy playing, something you connect with, and, and just play that to the best possible standard that you can because um, it, like doing something simple but well always sounds better than something complicated but shit essentially um, uh, I think that's all I have to say about that yeah and then I guess in in the rest of my application so I had to do I had to do the piece I chose which was a Foo Fighters tune and then I had to do uh, what did I say it was? Yeah, Rosanna by Toto. But that's a sort of, uh, that's similar to like telling the university, the conservatoire, that you have your grade eight. That's kind of them giving you a challenging piece of music and wanting to see that you can step up to that standard mm. that you getting your grades or whatever wasn't just a fluke and that you can actually perform to that standard. Um, I mean, I personally fluffed my given piece um at the time and i still kind of do it now i had a problem where i'd play and then i'd zone out and i started like staring out the window and i just missed something uh and i i, I came back in you know like i kind of did a little fill or a little flourish and and came back in um but i i, I don't know why i just zoned out it just happened um so I actually ended up getting a reserve spot. Um, I didn't actually get offered a place for the RMCM until, I think it was until the summer. So I spent a good few months because um, I only applied to the one place as well. That was stupid. Um, <laughs> yeah, don't apply to one place. It's really stressful. Uh, yeah, I spent the summer kind of contemplating what would I do if I didn't get in uh, and I spoke with Catherine, who's running this stream, a lot about it. Uh, and I spoke with my parents and my friends a lot about it. And I made some kind of other life plans just in case I didn't get in. And then thankfully, I got a call whilst um, at a festival. Um, and uh, yeah, it was the head of the course. And he said, right, one of the drummers has decided to, uh, he doesn't want to come this year. So do you want to come instead? I was like, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and that's a big thing as well. You can't, if you get the place, you generally can't defer your place um, unless there's like exceptional circumstances. Yeah, you can't defer your place um, like a normal degree because, um, because you might be amazing when you come in and do the audition, but then you will defer your place and you might spend the whole year not playing come back the next year and like just be rusty as all hell not be able to play your instrument uh, so yeah that's a big thing uh, cool that's the application stuff covered uh, what was my next no pop versus classical versus jazz uh, yeah okay so this is kind of dictated by instrument choice a lot of the time but also just the music that you like. Uh, there are, are so many different courses out there um, that cover so many different types of things. Uh, it very much depends what you're going for. Um, the, so if you're going for pop stuff, like I did, kind of pop, rock, contemporary music, um, there's obviously the RNCM that I studied at. There is uh, ACM in Guildford. Uh, those guys are great. Um, 
There is there's BIM, which I think they have a place in Brighton, London, and Manchester. I don't know. I think there might be one in Germany as well. It's kind of fun. Uh, yeah, and there's a couple of smaller courses as well. Um, oh, there's a there's another place in Manchester at Salford Uni that does a similar kind of degree. Um, I personally went for the RNCM because it seemed more. Uh, they seemed more selective in who they let onto the course. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. But um, I don't want to sound like a dick. But I, I know certain people that have been through places like ACM and have come out the other side like amazing players. But I think a lot of that is because they are very driven musicians anyway uh, and would have succeeded wherever they went. Um, I've also seen a lot of people come out the other side of those kinds of places and have spent two or three years just getting high and not really getting much out of it. Oh, Leeds. Leeds is the other place that has a great pop course. Almost forgot. Um, so, yeah, that's why I went for the RNCM. Um, I did consider Leeds as well because um, I heard good things about that place. Um, in terms of if you want to study jazz, um, obviously like London is kind of the place to be. This is a big thing as well. If you're studying music, you want to be where the music is. Um, it might sound stupid, but you want to be in a place where there is a community and a scene already there for you to just like jump into and go to gigs and see live music and talk to people. Um, so, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, so, if you're going for jazz, London is typically the place that most people go for, um, just because it's kind of the central hub of the UK. Um, and they've got all of the kind of big name colleges there. So there's Royal Academy of Music, Royal College of Music, Guildhall, Trinity, um, and there's loads of other like kind of smaller places as well. Uh, there's some really good, good courses I've heard about elsewhere in the UK as well. Uh, I can't remember the names of any of them, but I think part of that's just check out where, check out the cities, you know, because that's a big, that's super important, and a super important part of moving somewhere new. Uh, you know, you don't want to go somewhere to study music and then the city itself not have a kind of bubbling uh, nightlife of, of venues and gigs uh so you know if you're looking for universities have a look at uh like leeds is a great example because they've got a cool jazz course there and they've got an awesome kind of little scene bubbling away over there and manchester's got a pretty cool scene as well of that sort of stuff um and uh, yeah so having a look at the city that you you will be living in as well uh super important you know, if you're going to move to Guildford for ACM, it's like, okay, Guildford has um, some really, really great venues, and it's connected by the train system to to London and Portsmouth and Brighton and loads of other places. So it's it's great for kind of commuting to a bunch of diff different cities. Uh, so you can consider things like that uh, if you're willing to get on a late night, hour and a half train. Um, in terms of classical courses, again, I'm not going to preach too much about this because I don't know loads about them, uh, but I know people that have done them. Uh, again, a lot of the places that do either like pop stuff or jazz stuff are typically establishment, like classical music establishments first. Uh, so the RNCO is one of them, like Royal College and Royal Academy in London are both. Uh, like the jazz courses there are a very small parts of quite a large um, society of classical musicians. Um, so, yeah, just do it, doing your research <laughs> and, uh, and, and look at, look at like who teaches there. Um, that's something I, I, I found interesting is, um, you know, 
it's okay to kind of semi stalk who you might be learning under. Um, so like a big thing for me about coming to Manchester is that one of the drum tutors is a guy called Dave Hassel, uh, who is like a Yoda of the drums. Uh, <laughs> and like, I didn't really know who he was before coming to university and before meeting him. Uh, but I had like, I had one of his books, didn't really make the connection until I met him. Uh, but I had one of his books and like, I just went and did a bit of research and found out that like, Oh, holy crap. He's done like all of this kind of session and stuff or whatever. Um, and yeah, you can do a similar thing with, with any of the places you're interested in. Most of these conservatoires have like a section of their website that will have the, the members of staff go through that and check out who the members of staff are, like see what they do, type their names into YouTube, Google, LinkedIn, whatever, see, you know, who do they play with? Who have they played with? Uh, have they been on any like big recordings, all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, you want to be learning from people that are still actively doing what they're teaching because the music industry moves so quickly that, um, if that person is solely a teacher, I'm not saying this is a bad thing, but if that person is solely a teacher and doesn't play, then how do you know that you're getting up to date and correct information? You know, they might have stopped gigging 15 years ago when, you know, Spotify wasn't really a thing. So how can they advise you on things like that when, uh, they're out of touch with the current, uh, musical climate. So that's something to watch out for. Um, and do it with like not even the instrumental tutors, but just like all the tutors. When I first moved here, I found it really interesting. I went through, I looked at all the teachers that I was going to have for the first term and I, I just looked them up. Uh, and it just meant that I had like an instant connection with my tutors when I showed up. Um, you know, the guy that was teaching me about how to use DAWs, uh, which is like the software you use to record stuff in, if you don't know, like Logic and Ableton. Uh, so we're having lessons in how to use that. Um, but he's, uh, this guy called Rodrigo Constanzo and he's an amazing, like noise kind of experimental musician and never would have known that if I hadn't I'd just done a little bit of research. And so we have loads of great discussions about kind of cool bits of technology and things like that. Uh, cool. Okay. Uh, there's enough on that. Bit of my drink. Like I say, if anyone's got any questions as well, please do feel free to just uh, chuck them in the chat because uh, I'd be interested to see if anyone wants to know anything like particular about anything I've talked about so far or if you've got any other questions. Um, <coughs> so the next note I'd made for myself is about the lifestyle, which is obviously quite different at the minute because there's no gigs happening. So that makes music university really weird. Um, but when everything returns to normal and it will, um, you know, it will take time, but everything will return to normal or as normal as normal is. Um, the lifestyle surrounding, uh, music conservatoire existence is, plays a massive role in it um, to a degree that you wouldn't really think of. Um, but uh, yeah, so obviously you can sit in your classes all day and learn music theory and learn how to play your instrument and learn industry things and all this sort of stuff. Uh, that, that sort of stuff is only useful if you go out and try it. Uh, you know, you kind of have to, to go and do things and get it wrong, uh, to know, to learn, to learn. You have to, you have to do that. Um, it's the same with anything, you know, you have to, you kind of learn how to do something, you get it wrong, try again. Um, it's exactly the same and you will only get that experience from, from going and doing, doing gigs. Uh, and you know, if that's what you're interested in. So like for, for me, for example, like I, I joined function bands, which is like wedding bands. 
Uh, I play with, uh, like, I play for artists, like singer-songwriters. I also play my own music and in more, like, uh, cohesive original ensembles. Um, and and so, like, and and when I first moved here, um, I, I went, I tried to go to a gig, like, every night I could. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like get back from lectures, do all my work, uh, because really it's music work. Like it's not hard. It's pretty fun most of the time. So I'd get back, like do my practice, do my work, whatever. Uh, and then eat some food and go out, like just go out and find a gig that was happening. Uh, because even if you end up like I ended up going to loads of gigs just by myself and that's like, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. That's really fun. Uh, yeah, because you can just find, I mean, A, you're building this kind of network. Of, you've already got your bubble of musicians at your university, and then you're just expanding that network by going and meeting people in the real world uh, from from going to gigs uh, and going to, yeah, and either like playing gigs or, or just going and watching and talking to people after their set. You know, if you really enjoyed something, just go up to someone and talk to them about it. Uh, you might spark a connection, and then that person might remember you six months down the line and go, "Oh, that guy was that girl. That person was was you know super nice, and they said they played bass or something. And I need a bass player. Let's call them up." Uh, that sort of stuff happens all the time, all the time. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's cold. Uh, so, what was I saying? I don't know. Uh, what was I saying? Gigs. That was it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, getting out in whatever city you're in and just exploring the musical landscape, because uh, you will find you will find music that you like. You will also find. Uh, completely new and alien and bizarre music, you know, and go to stuff of all different levels. Um, if you've got the money for it, go to the like local massive pop gig, you know, go see Ariana Grande when she comes into town because you might not like the music, but you can certainly appreciate the level of musicianship and the proficiency that goes into putting on a show like that. Um, like I went and saw, when was it, like a, two years ago maybe, I went and saw Take That. It was amazing. Uh, you know, I know some of the songs because my mum likes the band. Uh, I'm not a massive fan, but, you know, they're still pretty good. They write, there's, It's good pop music. Uh, but I went because uh, my girlfriend at the time was in the show and just like, watching the discipline of someone playing to an arena of... 20,000, 30,000 people. It's it's insane. But then going from that and then going to the local, like, just kind of, well, not smoky jazz club, but the smokeless jazz club, um, and watching some, like, trio just blitzing away for four hours, completely improvised. Two completely alien worlds of playing, but still connected in some way. You know, there's, there's discipline there in both of those uh, that can be appreciated from from any musician, hopefully. And that's a that's a good point to make actually. If you're gonna do something like this, don't limit yourself to the music that you like. Um, like I very much started my degree, uh, moved up here mostly just being into. Um, Sorry, mostly just being into kind of rock and metal stuff, uh, and I just thought, oh, I'm just going to end up like playing in a couple of rock bands and metal bands and that sort of it. But like, throw that out the window instantly uh, because y you can learn so much from other styles of music, uh, which can then be applied into into everything else. Um, Every, everything feeds back. Everything feeds back to just like you as a musician. Uh, so, you know, you might not like folk 
singer-songwriters or something, but go down to an open mic night that week and just check it out and see what you think. Because uh, there might be one person there that you really connect with. Uh, and Or you might decide that you hate it and that you got absolutely nothing from it. Uh, but then you you know, you know that. <laughs> and you know that it's like, okay, maybe that sort of thing's not for me. Um, but yeah, so the skills I've learned from playing in, in rock bands can transfer across to folk and country, which can transfer across to uh, jazz, which can transfer across to uh, orchestra playing, which, you know, it all feeds into itself. Um, and and knowing how that applies to one another is, is, is only learned through either going and playing the music or, or going and watching a pro do it. Uh, and you know really listening um okay cool that's that uh oh before i move on i will say obviously going to gigs does mean that you're at bars and clubs all the time you don't have to get drunk at every gig <laughs> it yeah it shouldn't have to be said but it should be said you don't have to drink at every single gig you will spend so much money and uh yeah know why you're going to the gig uh because i've certainly gone to gone to some things intending to like go check out some amazing guitar player and then i just had a few drinks too many and you just stop really focusing on the music if you're going to some like party band to go have a good time then yeah go for it go nuts whatever but if you're going to like get something from the night uh, you know want to expand your mind you you want to learn more about jazz by going and watching a real quartet playing in a bar or something and you know like just have a tap water <laughs> it's free uh, yeah and these places can be expensive as well yeah you don't want to be spending all your government loan money on beer uh, not all of it anyway some of it not all of it <laughs> Uh, so, the classes and the courses. So, uh, it's obviously dependent on where you go and study and what course you go on. Uh, but a general, like, things that are usually covered by most courses uh, will, will definitely be your musicianship. Uh, you know, wherever you go, you will, hopefully get lessons in the instrument that you play. Um, if you don't, then don't go there, because what's the point if you're not getting better at your instrument? Um, yeah, so you'll, you'll certainly have musicianship kind of classes, uh, which I think are probably the, the, the most important part of the entire study. You know, it's it's the thing that's at the core of everything you do, unless you're going and doing production or business or management or something like that. If you're going onto a course as a player, um, your playing should be at the core of it. It sounds stupid, but it is. Um, so, you know, don't miss a lesson because you're hungover. Uh, you know, be respectful to those tutors. Um, that they're there to help you. Uh, this isn't, I, I think a, a big problem that a lot of people have with this kind of course is that they treat it too much like school. Uh, and they just decide that it's like, ah, you know, I don't need to show up to this or that because you know, I know that already. I've learned everything I need to learn. Um, yeah, check your ego at the door because there's always something you can learn. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you would rather stay in bed rather than go to your lecture, that's like, uh, you know, you're paying a lot of money every year to not go to your lessons. What's the point? You should have just stayed at home. Um, but, you know, you can stay in bed once you're done with a degree. <laughs> just, uh, just go to your lectures. <laughs> um, because, yeah, the people there... You might think they don't have anything to, to tell you, but they do. They really do. Um, and sometimes it just takes you being, you know, 
learning is a two-way street. It takes a good teacher. It also takes a good student. Um, you, you've you've got to like show up, give a shit, um, show that you give a shit, uh, and put the work in. Because if you don't put the work in, um, you're not going to develop whatever it is that you want to do, whether it be uh, wanting to learn, like wanting to develop your oral kind of listening skills uh, or your playing skills or anything like that. Um, yeah, showing up and giving a shit, super important. Uh, yeah, so some of the other things that I had covered, so obviously playing, big part, very big part. Um, theory uh, is, is, like, even as a drummer, uh, the theory is super important. And I think, I mean, I don't want to uh, just make a general sweeping statement, but it's typically drummers and singers that are the worst at theory, from my experience. And I think a lot of that has to do with um, the instrument that we play. Uh, like, we don't apply it, really, in, in practice. You know, if you're a, a horn player, a guitar player, a keys player, it's kind of ingrained in what you do. Uh, you know, you can't pull off playing some solo over a blues without understanding what notes to play to make it sound good. Otherwise, it just sounds like some kind of incoherent mess. Um, so obviously, you can't really apply that theoretical knowledge so much if all you're doing is hitting drums or, or singing. Um, something I would say to singers is, uh, well, actually, to any, any instrumentalist is... Um, if you don't, then just, you know, you don't have to pick it up to an, a, an amazing level, but try a second instrument. Just try playing anything else. Um, because it will vastly widen your understanding of like what everyone else is thinking. So I play drums primarily, but I also just do a little bit of guitar and things like that. Not to any like amazing standard at all, but like I know where the notes are. I can do a few chords and riffs and stuff, and and like I know the layout of a keyboard and can do a few chords and and, and little melodies and stuff, but nothing like nothing good. <laughs> but it's enough that if I'm in a group of people, like say I'm in a band and we're struggling to I don't know like write the write the you know we're writing a chorus for a song and we can't figure out why it's not working. You know, there's something not quite working there. Uh, and it's helpful to be able to be that person in the band that if you're the drummer, you can join in in the conversation about the, the chords and the melody. You can say like, oh, you know, try this thing instead. Uh, and vice versa, you know, if you're the guitar player or the keys player or the bass player or the singer or whatever, it's, it's helpful to be able to like have a bit of knowledge about every instrument that you're going to be interacting with. Um, you know, if you're trying to explain something to a drummer, it's like, Oh, can you just do the thing? No, no, like if you can, even if you just like beatbox the idea, um, and like that's so makes it so clear that, to the person that you at least kind of understand what you're hearing in your head and being able to communicate what you hear in your head is really helpful. Um, and that's a skill that I suppose you will probably learn through just through doing stuff. But, um, but yeah, being a, being able to like vocalize instruments. I know it sounds really dumb, um, but being able to vocalize um, different instruments is quite a like it's a small skill, but it's really helpful. Uh, if, if you can turn to the singer and just say like, "Oh, what about this harmony?" It's like. Doo -doo -doo. Or, you know, you can sing like the guitar line or, 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 or something. You know, you don't have to be a virtuoso singer or beatboxer, but if you can just do it to a degree where you're hitting notes-ish and people are understanding like the melodic shape and the rhythmic uh, kind of idea, then, uh, then you're able to just communicate with everyone in the ensemble so much more effectively. And if everyone can do that, then uh, it makes working so much easier.
Um, okay, what other stuff, what other courses and classes were covered? Uh, so from my course anyway, uh, I don't, it's, it, this is the sort of thing that comes in varying degrees on different courses. Uh, we had uh, lectures to do with industry, which is really helpful. Um, you learn different stuff about uh, like the social media game and uh, making websites and all that sort of all the stuff that you don't really think of as a musician uh, in this day and age is is really important. And if you watched uh, Ash's talk yesterday morning, um, then he covers this stuff in way more detail than I ever could. But um, yeah, it's it's unnervingly important. <laughs> Uh, and it's it's good to get your head around this stuff early on because the sooner you can, you know, especially if you're, say, writing your own, like trying to promote your own music or, or get gigs or uh, like promote yourself as a kind of session player or, or anything, you know, anything that is a form of self-promotion. You can't just pop a flyer on a, on a cork board in a communal space and hope someone calls you these days you know you have to have like the instagram presence and facebook presence and all and a website and all this sort of stuff so that if someone turns around to you and says oh hey how do you, you know i need a drummer and you just send them a link and it has everything there um so it's important stuff to learn uh that uh yeah that's quite a weird thing as well uh is that a lot of people post there are like groups on Facebook where people post uh, post gigs in the local area or just across the whole UK sometimes, um, and and so like having a finger on that sort of stuff, you don't always have to go for it. You know, I don't read, I kind of don't go for that stuff that much. But uh, if that's the world that you want to go towards of like session playing and playing in uh, theatre shows and uh, function gigs and wedding bands and stuff like that you know, gigs that have money behind them, if you want to earn some money. Uh, that typically for, is, is a way that a lot of people get gigs. Uh, you know, if you're not getting gigs off of recommendation uh, and word of mouth, then that's quite a big thing as well, is people will just put up a post saying, um, I, need a, I need a sax player for a wedding this Saturday. Uh, any any anyone free and and you get like 20 people replying uh oh question would you recommend that people start building a social media presence before applying to uni so that they have an acumen for the modern music industry uh no i wouldn't say that that's the most important thing in the world uh because i don't know exactly how much universities look at your online presence um, because I don't work for a university so I can't exactly uh, say it it can't hurt you know that I suppose that's the most I could say about that is that the worst that could happen is that they see it and they see that you're an actively gigging musician uh, <laughs> or I suppose the worst that could happen is they just don't see it um, and 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 even even in like a local scene having having some kind of like online presence is helpful because it helps you to expand beyond that, whether it's your town or your borough or whatever, it helps you to expand out of that to meeting people locally or internationally. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's not the most important thing in the world to have the social media stuff preset up. And like I'm talking about, like this is why I went to the music uni because uh, and why I went to RNCM because they have courses on how to develop this stuff. You, you know, it's it's the same as the playing thing. And when you're doing your application, doing your uh, audition, you don't have to have uh, like you don't have to be a perfectly rounded player. You also don't have to have the amazing social media presence and the amazing this and be the perfect kind of theory bob and a producer and all this sort of stuff. The reason why you're going to the university is to learn this stuff. So it's okay to have weak spots. Um, 
but to be aware of what those weak areas are, uh, I think is is probably helpful. Um, yeah, if you if you're able to uh, to pinpoint what your your weaknesses are, uh, and being that that level of self awareness uh, is probably pretty helpful uh, because you're able to to go in knowing what it is that you're like why you're going to further education. Um, you know, if, if 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 you're thinking, oh, okay, I want to go to this place because I want to get better at jazz. Uh, you know, I want to be a jazz player, but I also want to play in a big band, or I also want to do, I also want to learn about the side, like the side of the industry at the same time. Then find the course that does that for you. Uh, find what you want to do and what weak areas you want to improve on, um, and then find the thing that suits that. Uh, no point doing something you don't want to do because it's four years, three or four years sometimes. Uh, and you know, it's a lot of time to, to waste doing something you don't want to do. Um, <laughs> cool. What was my next point? Uh, bands and ensembles. Okay. Yeah. So obviously a big part of going to a music conservatoire is, um, is, the like playing in ensembles part of it that obviously differs in what course you're on uh if you're on a classical music course then uh typically the university sets up i know the universities often have a lot of ensemble opportunities that it's like you have to apply to get in so it will be uh orchestras and and varying like quartet uh quintet like trios, all the, all the different varying sizes of stuff that you can apply for to get into, I think is normally the way that it works with those sorts of things. Um, but don't be afraid to go and look externally as well. You know, uh, find the local orchestra and go go sit in or something like that. Uh, with jazz courses, I know typically there's there's an emphasis on uh there's an emphasis on like big band playing uh and then also like smaller ensemble playing because they're kind of the two realms that you will operate in a lot uh and that's not to say that jazz colleges are stagnant and stuck in the 50s and 60s uh like a lot of people think they might be uh, a lot of it of that mode of thinking is you are you're learning the kind of tradition. You're learning the history of the music. Um, you can't push forward without first uh, at least acknowledging what's come before. Um, and so that's a really big part of those courses is, uh, and, and to be fair, like the popular music kind of contemporary courses as well, a big part of it is understanding that there is a hundred years of of musical culture behind you, you know, you've got a lot of catching up to do <laughs> and, uh, and it will take your entire life to, to fully appreciate all of that. I'm sure. But, um, that's a, a big part of the courses that of these courses is that you're understanding and respecting and learning that kind of back catalog of music and culture and, and, and so that you can make, informed decisions about what you do um you know it's they're not necessarily chucking you into a big band because you're going to be a big band player all your life or they're not chucking you into some like session orchestra thing some like pop thing because that's what you're going to do all your life but it's because uh the, like it's it's a thing that's come before it's a skill that may be called upon you at some point uh, which so it's helpful to be able to do that thing, um, but it's also just learning the context of where the music has come from, uh, so that you can push it further. Uh, you know, and you never know what you might draw inspiration from. You might be like a through and through like thrash metal gent kind of guy uh, or gal or whatever, uh, but or you might be super into I don't know like Dua Lipa and Charlie XCX and Ariana Grande. But 
being able to draw influence from music that's come before can then inform what you've done or what you're about to do. Um, you might not think it, but you might draw inspiration from some like Count Basie big band thing. You never know. It might just be like a rhythmic idea or a chord or a melody or a feel or a feeling. Um, but learning that context is, is, is really important. Um, yeah. Uh, is that what I've got to say about that? Yeah, sure. All right, cool. Uh, Oh yeah. And then on the realm of bands, so obviously you've got the ones that are university led, like big bands, orchestras, whatever, hot things. Um, but another part of, um, another part of playing in uni is, is obviously like starting your own stuff up. Don't be afraid to just like go and make a band the first week. And just see what happens, you know, get in a room with people and, and you don't have to have like an album written, just get in a room and play with some people and see what happens. Just jam. Um, yeah. Not being afraid to improvise, even if it's just like two people in a room, you know, whatever bizarre combination of instruments, if you can just find like one other person, get in a room with them and just play something, uh, and see what happens. Cause, uh, it's a great way to just, uh, if you've not got any gigs, especially, uh, then that's a great way of just taking like what you've learned that week and try and apply it, try and apply it in a, in a, like in a stress-free, no pressure jam with a friend, with a housemate or a flatmate or whatever. Um, you know, if you've been learning some work, so what me and some friends used to do in first year is we used to, we had like this prog trio rush ripoff thing <laughs> and what we used to do is we'd take like the the rhythmic ideas that i'd been learning that week in my drum lessons uh and the harmonic uh ideas that the guitarist james had been learning in his lessons that week and we just like try write a song using or like even if it was just like a riff using those uh, things so that we're we're taking that knowledge out of the theoretical realm and putting it into a practical application. So um, that's always something that's quite fun and allows you to just uh, but yeah, because there's there's obviously like different stages of learning that sort of stuff. Um, the, there's the there's the very like technical kind of you're sitting and like reading a book or listening to a piece of music and trying to play along and it's the like the technical side of it um but what you really want is to like each of those things that you're learning every week and like it can be a lot of stuff sometimes but everything that you're learning every week um you want to find a way of integrating that into your playing um because you don't want to be sat when it comes to, if you come to do an actual gig, uh, you don't want to be sat there thinking like, Oh, uh, you know, think about rudiments or think about just, you know, Oh, what else should I be right now? Ah! You know, you don't want to be thinking that stuff. Cause if you are thinking that stuff, you're not, um, you're not present in the music. Um, you're not, yeah. If you're not in the music, then you're going to make mistakes and <laughs> you're going to just end up like aimlessly dreading some scale. Uh, and everyone's going to just like turn around and be like, what the hell's this guy doing? Shut the fuck up. <laughs> uh, so yeah, like doing, doing that kind of playing in a no stress, zero pressure environment is, is really helpful because you can then like, you can, internalize those skills to the point where they're muscle memory and you don't have to think about the technical side of it. And then you're able to just like what I've heard a lot of people talking about, um, is, is this kind of like flow state thing that you're trying to achieve, uh, where it's basically, if you can hear it in your head, then you should be able to sing it. Uh, and then if you can sing it, you should be able to play it. Uh, and then if you can do all three, then you should be able to make that connection like instantaneously in the moment. 
Uh, so that's, that's, I mean, I still can't do that half the time, but it's quite an interesting thought process that if you're playing a piece of music, you want to go for something and, uh, and land it and it be musically coherent and not just like someone falling down the stairs, uh, and it works and you pull it off rather than like, oh, you slipped up because there was that technical thing that you didn't quite practice enough. Um, okay, cool. So, on the subject of bands, uh, yeah, I'm going to kind of divert a bit now. So, if there's any other questions about university stuff, then ask away. Um, but I'm going to move on to, like, bands territory now. Uh, so, whilst playing at uni, I've gotten involved in a lot of different kind of styles of music and a lot of different ensembles and genres of music and things like that. Um, which I, I think just for me is just because it's fun. <laughs> More than anything, uh, I, I like kind of, uh, I know that there are kind of different areas of my playing that I want to stretch and I can't necessarily stretch them all in one band. Uh, if I could, it'd be a really weird band. You know, like for for me anyway, it's like I love doing the just kind of like Dave Grohl, hard as hell rock drumming, but I also love uh, just like soundscape and and really soft, delicate kind of Joey Ronka, uh, like he plays for Beck, uh, really delicate playing and and all the kind of like country guys and blues stuff as well. Um, but then I also play in a band where it's like kind of art poppy dance stuff and so i've managed to get in and there's still other things that i want to try do that i don't have a band for that i want to push those areas of my playing but it's it's nice to have some different things where it's like okay well i'm when i'm playing in the folk setting i'm in like it's like this mode but when i'm in the rock band i'm in this mode um and so that um i'm like in in the context of music pushing my playing to um, like pushing my playing as far as I can go and I don't mean in terms of like playing every single note because like in the folk band I hardly play anything but that is still pushing my playing because it's more about exploring sounds and touch and feel on the instrument rather than uh, rather than yeah like crunchy chords or, or crazy chops or anything like that uh, so in those bands, it's quite interesting to see that there's there's actually some like quite different and alien dynamics that sometimes end up happening. Um, typically, like in any band I'd been in before coming to university, the dynamic was always like a shared thing. Uh, this might be different for whoever's listening, but um, for me anyway, because I was mostly in kind of rock and metal, like that sort of area of bands uh it was like a shared experience you know there was like everyone kind of wrote a bit in the band and every, it was like an even split everyone had uh everyone was like invested in it emotionally and financially sometimes uh and that is the way that most like most bands of that style operate but a big thing of coming to to college was the everyone or almost everyone has their own thing because people want to explore expressing themselves musically and like that's totally fair but it also means that you get like so many different uh bands and ensembles that not everyone can be you know 100 percent emotionally invested and financially invested especially uh and and they can't invest you know all their time into having like six rehearsals a week uh because well for example like i'm in like four or five different bands and like that's not loads but it's enough to keep you busy um but it it does also mean that there's kind of an understanding between me and some of the other people in the band that it's like okay so it's very definitely like this person's band it's almost uh like a kind of steely dan situation where where you've got the one or two people in the ensemble that write the music 
and fund everything or you know like they, they they're the like they're the, the cornerstone of of the ensemble and then everyone else in it we can still be great friends uh, and be emotionally invested in it and love the project but are almost seen as session players um you know and unfortunately not yet anyway none of us are at the level where the session players can be paid <laughs> But sometimes with those smaller ensembles, like that's just uh, you have to put in the groundwork to get the reward. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so there's a, I mean, I, even my band Cold Comforts, where, so I play guitar and sing in that, but it's like primarily my thing because I write all the music or like 95% of it. Uh, and like organize all the recording sessions i pay for like music videos and rehearsal rooms and all that sort of stuff so that's like it's my responsibility to get that stuff done um and then the other three guys in the band whilst being like my my best friends in the world and amazing musicians they they we have this kind of understanding this back and forth understanding that it's like they are in other bands um that you know they, they are also in five or six other bands they they can't possibly help pay money for rehearsal rooms for every single band because then you know especially when they're not getting paid for what they're doing <laughs> they're, they'd all be broke as hell uh so that's that's quite an interesting dynamic that happens quite a lot i've found anyway is that you have people that have their project uh and you kind of session play in it um but it's it's a fun dynamic anyway. It's a it's a fun way of playing. Um, okay, moving on from that. Uh, there are well, I suppose it's probably a good way to transition into um, the tour booking side of stuff. So when I was in my fourth year of uni, um, we had to do uh, it was like a work placement uh, for our fourth year, and for my work placement uh, loads of people did different things some people did teaching uh some people did uh some people went and like did some stuff abroad some people went went and worked uh at record labels some people worked with like festivals doing the booking and the organizing some people worked with charities there's loads of sorts of stuff uh, that we ended up doing um but i ended up just saying uh like look i want to do my own thing because i was doing enough uh so function band stuff weddings sessions all that sort of stuff uh and session playing so with the bands that i've just talked about that i was kind of busy enough with that anyway uh and that's what i could see myself doing after university has covid not hit um so I, I kind of said to them, look, this is what I'm going to do. And I think a few other people did it as well. Um, I know some people uh, that, so like Sam Harding and Alex Blake, they both moved down to London and they now play with Harlow Parks. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> but that's what they did for their placement. So, uh, yeah, so the <laughs> what I chose to do was something akin to that of like, I'm just going to go and do my own thing. I'm going to set it up whilst I've got the safety net of, like I've still got government loan coming in and uh, and I don't have real world responsibilities really because I'm still in the degree. I was still, uh, you know, don't have to worry about council tax <laughs> and boring stuff like that. Uh, so what I decided to do was I wanted to kind of elevate um, the band uh, Cold Comforts. I wanted to elevate it sort of to the, not really the next level because we'd only just really started um you know i'd only been writing songs for that project for maybe like half a year so i basically wanted to take the time um that i had left at university and i wanted to take this opportunity to my thinking behind it was a beatles in hamburg experience on a smaller <laughs> and possibly slightly less effective scale um, so basically, if you don't know what I'm talking about, the Beatles went and spent months in Hamburg just like playing before they even were the Beatles. They were the Civil Beatles uh, and just playing like all the local clubs. They played like two or three 
thing tonight. And the, the point that I'm getting to is that they, they did that. They came back, they changed their name to the Beatles, released some singles, and then went and just did the most blistering like leg, leg of shows around the UK that you could imagine because they'd spent months just becoming this like crazy, crazy good band writing these amazing songs. So that was kind of my thinking behind it, just on a small scale, because I didn't have months. Uh, I didn't have the money to take us to Hamburg. <laughs> and the gigging scene has very much changed to what it was in the 60s, obviously. Um, so what my thought was is that I was going to book this tour around the UK. We'd go do that, even if it meant playing to, you know, a bloke and his dog or the sound engineer, like just having the experience of getting in the car uh, loading all our stuff on top of us, sitting cramped for like six hours, uh, and getting to some bizarre little venue in the middle of nowhere and just playing a show and and learning that way. Uh, and it kind of goes full circle back to what I was talking about at the start of the talk of uh, learning something and then going and doing it in the real world and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes. You can sit as a band in a rehearsal room for... For, for forever you can you can be in a rehearsal room for as long as you like uh but then you will come out to gig and something will always go wrong <laughs> it's just the way it is uh especially if lots of technology stuff is involved you know if you've got backing tracks or like ableton live stuff or crazy keys patch setups or something or you know anything else going on the first few times you do something, it will always go wrong, guaranteed. <laughs> and uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Like that's just a learning experience. Um, because when you're in a rehearsal space, it's it's a safe environment. You know, there's no pressure there. You can get things wrong. You can stop songs. Uh, if something breaks, you can just stop and fix it. Um, so yeah, the idea being is that we'd go and do gigs, uh, and and make loads of mistakes, probably annoy the hell out of people that didn't want to see our crappy little band, uh, but then come out the other side of it a much better band. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I'd say that it, it worked. You know, the first gig that we did was pretty shaky, pretty ropey, uh, and, uh, you know, loads of mistakes in terms of the playing. I was awkward as all hell because I never really... We'd done like one gig before we went out and did the tour. Uh, and so I just like was not accustomed to talking on stage to people. I'm still not really um, because this was only December last year. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago and there's not really been any gigs this year. Uh, so <laughs> the, the standard has probably dropped a bit, but we'll, we'll get back to it. Um, but by the end of the tour, it was it was amazing. Like we we just kind of got to the point where you get into the rhythm of everything, uh, and you, things that you had to think about loads before, even silly little things like oh where's my tuna or oh, where's the power supply or oh what was the next chord in that song or the lyric or something. By the last day of the tour, we were just like plug in, turn up, boom, uh, and the gig just flew by. Uh, so yeah, I'd say to a degree it, it it did the job that it intended. Um that being said, as lovely as that all sounds, booking the tour was an absolute nightmare. <laughs> uh and uh I have no one but myself to blame. <laughs> uh yeah, any sensible person that has been in a band uh, to any modicum of success will tell you that touring after having done two gigs and released no music is an awful idea because no one will come to those gigs um, and the gigs will be very hard to book and this was true so what we did pre-booking the tour is actually no to, so to book the entire tour uh, I sent round to promoters a demo we, did, we didn't even have, like, a recorded song. We just had this crappy little, like, half-finished demo that I was sending around to venues and promoters and whoever I could. Uh, and it was only, like, maybe a few weeks before the tour was set to begin that we sort of turned around and thought, 
oh, we really need something to uh, we really need something for people to check out whilst we're like once we've announced these dates <laughs> we need we need something to be like a reason for going on tour because we couldn't really promote it as the cold comforts does the beatles in hamburg uh <laughs> so we yeah we like hastily recorded our first single i think we did it in like a week uh in a church uh, it's super boomy and it sounds i think it sounds great but it's funny uh yeah the yeah. The, the pressure made us uh, make quick decisions. You know, we didn't sit around going, oh, what should we do for this guitar tone or this chorus or whatever? Just like, plug the amp in and <laughs> put the mic in front of it and go. Uh, we did it like all, all in our flat, basically, and James, the guitarist, mixed it. Uh, and then, yeah, so we had it out. I think it was maybe two weeks before the tour was due to start so that we could... And like this is again by no means a good way to do this, but we just thought we should release the single before the tour was announced, so that uh, we could be like, okay, you've heard the song, now come hear it in gigs in, in real life, alongside a bunch of other unreleased music. Um, so we did that, um, and to book the tour. Uh, so this is where a lot of my lectures at university actually came in really handy. Um, I had a tutor actually helping me, uh, giving me some advice on some stuff, which was uh, pretty invaluable. So I've got to say um, thanks to my tutors, Jen and Suki, for helping me out with that. But, um, yeah, so the, 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 the first way, the first thing I did, first thing I did was uh, I just trawled the internet and I asked, like, I just put, recommendation thing out on Facebook and Instagram and I asked all my friends and I absolutely trawled through the internet of just like looking up menus in this city, uh, you know, promoters in this city. And I, I made a, oh, I, I looked at something I found really helpful actually as well was looking at bands uh, who already had tours booked and looking at their posters and looking at where they were playing. Uh, and to, to kind of gauge like, okay, they're this size band and they're playing this size venue. Uh, so, you know, if they were a similar size band or, you know, just a bit bigger, it's like, okay, so it's achievable that we could be like the support band at that venue. You know, we could be the opening band at that venue, something like that. Um, so I did a lot of that and, uh, spreadsheets were my best friend <laughs> for the next month. Uh, yeah, I'm sure if anyone wants to see that, they can just uh, message Catherine. I can send it across to people if they really want to see it. It's pretty chaotic. Um, but essentially what I did is I just wrote down, like, the city, uh, the name of the venue, uh, and then, like, the name of the person I was contacting, uh, then, like, phone number, email address, the website I found any of these details on, like Twitter handle, Facebook, like any point of contact I could find for that venue or that person, I put on there. And then the very column, the column right at the very end was um, like, it was like a yes, no thing. Like, had I contacted them? Uh, and how did I contact them? Was it an email? Was it, did I call them? Um, yeah. And then I had a separate one. So that was so I did that for venues, and then I had a separate slide in the spreadsheet that is for promoters. Uh, I also used the same spreadsheet for uh, press. So there's a third slide or panel or whatever they're called on the spreadsheet Excel stuff for uh, for for like radio and press and bloggers and magazines. So exactly the same process, like names, email addresses, phone numbers, websites. Uh, just a huge list of like 100 or 200 names um, so that when the single came out, I just called these people or emailed these people. Um, yes, yeah, so once I'd collated all of that information, it was then the very long process of contacting all these people, uh, which just so happened to start when I just moved house and had no internet yet. So I did it all out of the local coffee shop around the corner. <laughs> and I sat there 
with a hot chocolate getting very cold because I'd be there for four or five hours and just sipping it every now and again so they didn't kick me out. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, I feel quite bad for that, but it's fine. They were all right with it. Um, and what I would do is I would... So, well, the first thing I did is I went through and I uh, I just cold called people. And, I like, I don't know what it is, but people these days just hate to... Like, people seem to hate talking on the phone. Um, like, I know a lot of people that just don't enjoy talking on the phone anymore. I don't know what it is. It's weird. Um, but it's the best way to get an answer to something quickly. Um, you know, if you email someone or you text them or you message them on Facebook, they might never see it because they might get a barrage of messages every day. They might see it and not reply. Um you know, there's all these kinds of things. But if you call someone, nine times out of ten, you're going to have someone pick up, even if it's a venue and you just get the guy that's on the bar that day and he tells you who to call or who to email. Um, but you're going to instantly get an answer. And if you don't, then you get a, you know, you leave a message on the voicemail. Remember to leave your phone number on the voicemail because uh, I had to call some places back a second time rather embarrassingly and just say like yeah that was me here's my number <laughs> call me back um so yeah remember to leave your number that's important um yeah because you'll just get the quickest answer that way because if you like i i think like a large percentage of the places that i got a no from that i could like definitely say no, we can't play that venue. Well, places that I called up and whoever it was, you know, the bar manager or the booking agent or someone that was on that day just turned around and said, yeah, no, sorry, you know, you're not a big enough band or um, we just don't have any, like, slots for opening bands in the time period that you're looking for or because we toured in December, a lot of the venues had things like, sorry, we've got, like, Christmas gigs on. Uh, so that was kind of a stupid thing um, and a bit of a bummer, but whatever. Uh, yeah, so that's the quickest way that you'll get an answer. And you, once you've made the first two or three calls, you, you'll get over the fear of, of going over people, I think. Uh uh, yeah, it's a good confidence booster, to be honest. Speaking to 150 total strangers in the space of two days. Uh, yeah, it's a good way to bolster that small talk. <laughs> uh, that's a very good point, actually. The way that uh, I kind of... The way I combated... Because I did feel a bit nervous just cold calling the first few people I did. Um, and so the way I combated it is I made up a... Word document with a script for myself, almost like <laughs> some kind of scam agency. And now I look back on it, it's quite bad. But uh, because I didn't want to just like get on the phone and fluster straight away and just say to the person, like, yeah, and yeah, okay, bye. <laughs> uh, so what I did was I, yeah, I wrote out a script for myself and I just said, like, made it as kind of eloquent and polite as possible, but without seeming like a robot you know it's a fine balance maybe that's the kind of thing that you have to bounce back and forth with like band members or i don't know parents or something or just just other people just to say like does this come across as being you know a bit big-headed or or just a bit rude or or whatever uh but yeah so i wrote myself a script um so that i could call people up and i knew then that it was like okay so if i've got this script I've got every piece of information I possibly need to convey to that person is in that script. You know, so it's like, okay, we're looking for a gig. That's <laughs> the most important one. This is the name of the band. This is the kind of music it is. Say something about the band. Like, what are the dates that we're looking for? Uh, if you have any other dates already booked, you know, mention those because it shows that people are actually booking you and, and that people give a shit. Um, yeah, so I did that, uh, and, and that helped greatly because then I was able to to call people and 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 I made sure that it was like okay, I'd, I've read through that in some form or another. I know I've definitely gotten across every point I needed to, even if they said no. 
I've said everything I needed to say. Um, yeah, so I, I I did that initially. I called all the people. Uh, and then everyone that I didn't get like an instant kind of yes, no, or here's my email address, I then, I then just went to the next column of contact information uh, and started doing that. So that I think the next thing after calling people was emailing them because typically places like venues, uh, promoters especially, uh, yeah, will will be fairly on it with their emails normally. Um, you know, some places do get swamped with them, so you might not get a reply off them. The the, the emailing process was very much similar to the calling process. Uh, so I wrote up a script. Uh, and in fact, I wrote up a few different scripts, uh, a few different versions of the same thing, but just detailing whether I knew the person or not was a big thing. So even if I had some like really tenuous connection, so some of them, it might have been, uh, some of them, like the first script I wrote was just a cold, cold email, uh, like, hello, sir, madam, da, 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 all the details about the band, just having like one link. And if they follow that link, it takes them to every bit. Like, I think I sent them the link and it just had a link to the website that I've made for the band. Uh, and on the website, you can in seconds just see everything about us. You know, you've got the music we've released, any videos, uh, SoundCloud links, information about a band, some pictures, da -da 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 -da, all that kind of stuff, Spotify, whatever. Um, and then, um, Oh, I also attached an EPK. So for people that don't know what an EPK is, um, oh no, that's what I ended up doing. Um, yeah, so I made an EPK. An EPK is an electronic press kit. Uh, it's typically what gets sent round to promoters uh, and venues and stuff when people are booking gigs, when people are doing releases. Uh, what it is is it's it's a press package. Uh, it's everything that that person would need to know about you, uh, and and what what it is that they're they're looking at. So it might just be like a one page document. I made it a page. Uh, actually, I took this from Ash, who did a talk yesterday morning. This was uh, his band, Malice and Blaze. I think do this. They have a kind of like secret hidden page. And we now do this as well, a secret hidden page on their website that you can only get to if you have the link. Uh, there's no button on the site to get to it. And it has your press kit on there. Because that means that the person that you're sending that to, they just have to click on the link and they've got everything there rather than uh, having to download a document. Because sometimes people don't have PDF readers or people just don't want to download your crap. Like, it's amazing. People just don't want to download shit. Um, and it's fair enough because if they get like a hundred emails from bands in a day. They don't want to download a hundred EPKs, but if they just click on a link, you know, that's not clogging up their computer with your stuff. Um, and also if they're going on a link, they can go straight to your Facebook, your YouTube, your SoundCloud, your Bandcamp, whatever. Um, so I found that pretty useful. Uh, so in terms of the script stuff, yeah. So I had the cold one that I would send to people that I didn't really know. Uh, I then had, uh, one, a uh, one for people that I kind of knew, uh, whether it was like through a mutual friend or a recommendation of a friend. So I'd kind of say, Oh, hi, uh, you know, person. In fact, yeah, I wrote hi X and I just had to make sure I'd delete the X and put in their name from the spreadsheet. Every time I wrote the email, hi X, uh, you know, uh, a mutual friend of ours, whoever, uh, recommended I get in touch, and then it was basically the same email, uh, just with all the information. Um, and then, and then I think I had a third version of that, which was, which was very similar. Oh, hi, Harry. <laughs> uh, I had a, a third email which was very similar, um, but it was like if I'd called them uh, when I was doing the cold calling, uh, if I'd called them already and had, say, a member of staff say. Oh, okay. Oh, you want to talk to, to, you know, Brian, here's Brian's email. Uh, and I'd like jot down his email and, and say like, okay, a member of staff gave me your contact. It's just forming like whatever point of, of contact, any connection with that person that you possibly can. 
and so that they, they don't think that you've just found your email off some random part of the internet because you know no one i'm sure if you get unsolicited emails you probably just delete them straight away obviously venues and promoters are much more accustomed to getting unsolicited emails but still no one likes getting them because they're normally just full of trash so making any kind of connection you can so you don't feel like a robot <laughs> uh, is 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 interesting What's this? As a promoter, a link is a perfect way. There you go. Uh, Catherine has just doubled down on my point there in the chat. So, yeah, a link is a great way to show your EPK because, because then you're not going to annoy the crap out of the promoter, essentially. Um, cool. So once I'd got, I'd called people, I'd emailed them, um, and... And from that, uh, I think I managed to get like maybe two or three booked from that, two or three gigs booked from that. And that was still like, I'd contacted maybe 100 to 150 people, venues, promoters, etc. at that point. So like the, the, the reward for the work was very small, but that's just sometimes what you got to do. Um, especially like, I think, what made it especially hard for us was that at the time we had no music out. We had basically like our fan base was friends and family. We'd only done two gigs, albeit like gigs that we'd put on and sold out, but we still had only done two gigs. So we didn't really have any reputation. You know, we were basically just another local kind of alternative band. Um, and the few people that did book us in, were just like very, very kind and put us on the start of the bill. What I then began to do is following up like a week or two later, not letting people forget who you are. Obviously, this is a fine line. You don't want to start bugging people. Uh, you know, you don't want to be messaging them every day or like every other day, just being like, why haven't you answered my email? Blah, blah, blah or calling them every day, because if you annoy someone, they're just going to like block you off uh, and never want to have anything to do with you ever again. Uh, and even worse, they might, you know, people still talk. <laughs> you know, someone that runs uh, a venue might talk to their promoter, and then the promoter might talk to the other venues, and then, you know, you're known as the annoying guy that keeps emailing everyone, or the annoying person, sorry, that keeps emailing everyone. Uh so yeah it's a fine line to balance when when following up if you haven't got a response uh i think i typically left it maybe like a week or so um before i'd follow up and and just like being very polite and just saying hi you know i hope you've had a chance to review this or check us out um let me know what you think and that, you know that's it just a short succinct little kind of so they get a little ping on their phone saying, oh, crap, I knew I meant to reply to that email. Um, yeah, so don't don't annoy people because <laughs> they, they won't work with you. Um, <laughs> um, what was I saying? Yeah, so uh, da -da 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 -da, emailing, calling. Um, yeah, I did initially want to, I wanted to try and make the tour, um, like, you know, when you see professional tour posters where they actually kind of make sense geographically and they kind of, they might do like a route around the country or across Europe or, you know, across the state. If you mapped out where the venues were, it would make sense, essentially. Uh, that is something I had to sacrifice. <laughs> Sacrifices had to be made to get the gigs, unfortunately, and it meant I did a lot of driving last December um, because yeah, we basically ended up having gigs that were quite spaced out. Uh, you know, sometimes they were a week apart. The tour itself actually went over, I think it was three and a half weeks for nine dates. So you can imagine there was a, a couple days between some of the gigs um, and some of the gigs were pretty far away. Like we're up in Manchester, and I think the furthest we had to travel was we did Portsmouth, um, which we tried to tie in with like 
dates further south and we just couldn't like it just didn't work out uh and actually the date in portsmouth was like i was really ill that day as well so we ended up driving for i think almost seven hours got to the gig played really badly because i was ill uh, and hadn't looked after myself uh and didn't know how to look after myself <laughs> it being my first tour that i'd booked and run uh and then yeah the next morning drove back up uh and that was that was pretty hard going um you know you learn from your mistakes <laughs> so uh yeah and and actually getting on the, the health part that's quite I've not really solved this yet. I'm, there are a myriad of people that have, but uh, when you have no money, it's quite hard to be healthy on the road. It's important to look out for yourself. Um, and a big part of the reason for the places that we played, uh, I tried to ensure that we were playing in cities or towns where we had some connection. Um, because if you're going to go play somewhere where you have absolutely zero connection, you're going to have absolutely zero people show up. Um, but at the very least, at every place we played, we either had like uh, a family member of the band that lived there, or uh, an old friend that had moved to that city, or something like that. You know, uh, so that uh, well, so that we'd have someone that would hopefully come to the gigs. Uh, <laughs> And also so that we could try and have somewhere to stay that night. That was a big part, was knowing where you're going to go after the gig. Um, you know, it's all well and good, good having the tour booked, promoting it to whatever degree you can. You know, we had no money to promote the tour, so it was purely just like, please come. <laughs> uh, but we went and did it. And, and yeah, knowing where we were going to be each night, um, knowing that I didn't have to drive for four hours, do a gig, and then drive for another four or five hours just to get back um, was a good feeling. <laughs> knowing that we could do a gig and, and you know, relax afterwards uh, uh, is, yeah, it's a, it's a lot better than, than stressing out about it. Um, we managed to not book a single hotel or, like, Airbnb or anything for the whole tour, which was really good. Um, what we did is we either we either had friends or family that we crashed on sofas, on floors, whatever. You know, if you're going to do this kind of DIY touring stuff, you've got to be comfortable with just chucking a sleeping bag on the floor and and sleeping where you fall. Um, but yeah, we we ended up staying with like friends, family, uh, even like pretty distant family members sometimes. You know, like cousins uncles whatever um but sometimes that was enough you know it's just a place to crash we'd get we'd get to that person's place they'd leave a key under the mat we'd they'd already be asleep we'd just go crash on the on the living room floor for a few hours and then wake up at like 7 a.m and drive back up to manchester for four hours because you know someone had a job to get to or <laughs> you know i had to be teaching the next day or something like that so uh that was uh, pretty interesting. Um, yeah, is there much else to say? Uh, we also, I say we, I made a load of merch for the tour as well. Uh, basically, I wanted this to be as low cost as possible because I'm a cheap bastard. <laughs> and I also just, I wanted to see how much of it we could do ourselves without needing someone else to come in and give us a hand. Uh, so I didn't know how to use Photoshop before the tour began or before we booked the tour. So I kind of like learned ish how to use it to make posters and promote like what little promotional material I actually made. Uh, I learned how to use that. Um, you know, it's amazing what you can do if you just Google, like if you have an idea in your head and you just go, how do I do this? And then a video pops up and you go, Oh cool. You do that. You know, just Google something if you don't have to. Um, and yeah, so ended up like printing, uh, like burn, just burning maybe 20 or 30 copies of our single onto a disc, printing out some sleeves, uh, putting them in like the little plastic wallets, 
getting some of the stickers and, and you know, just making them look as professional as we could to with the limitations of having no money. I didn't want to spend two hundred pounds on getting a hundred discs printed because A, I knew we weren't gonna sell that many <laughs> and B, like, yeah, that's just more money that we didn't have. Um uh, da, 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 da. Uh, and then yeah, I also made we also made t shirts, which was interesting because obviously you can pay a lot of money for making t shirts. Uh, and what we ended up going for was there's like this iron on transfer paper, you just print on it with a normal printer, and then you cut out the design uh, and iron it on. It kind of works, it looked pretty good. Uh, but again, like we managed to sell some merch, and like the nights where we sold some t shirts or some CDs, that kind of paid for the the crappy roadside food on the way back or the the petrol or something like that um yeah so uh screen printing is also another great way to go about just making your own t-shirts uh it's a bit more fiddly takes a bit more uh, like slightly more equipment and a bit of know-how but again nothing that you can google there was a question here did you make good connections doing this in order to facilitate the next tour uh yes Yes, we did, actually. Um, we did make some very good connections. Uh, so, yeah, so that's a, a big part of when we were going and doing the gigs was not just turning up, sitting in the corner, waiting to play, and then going and, like, leaving as soon as you finished. It was, like, as soon as you stepped foot on the premise of the venue, uh, you were... Uh, it was like business mode. Uh, you know. uh, so we'd make sure we'd go and talk to every single band that was playing that night if we could. You know, we, we'd, go and, we'd go and talk to the promoter. We'd go chat with people behind the bar while someone else was setting up. We'd go have a chat with the sound engineer. It's like, A, it's just nice to talk to other people. It's interesting to like hear all these people's stories. Um, and more importantly, you're just making that connection so that um, when you contact them again, you know, when gigs can happen again, um, you have that, you know, you have that connection and you can turn around and say, ah, oh, we loved playing here, you know, last year, or I suppose it would be two years ago um, on our last tour and we're coming around again and we're going to do bigger and better and whatever and would love to come play again. And and so having that point of connection is, is really important. Yeah. So um so making sure you're kind of you're 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 networking the entire time you're at the gig. You know, it's not just about the thirty minutes that you're on stage. That is very important. Definitely. That needs to be amazing. You know, you need to get up there and, and absolutely smash it. But um but the the downtime between like especially whilst people are like whilst everything's getting set up when you show up and showing up like getting there early and prepared you will not believe how important those two things are but yeah the, the band that looks the worst is the one that shows up five minutes before they play asking to borrow everyone's apps the the people that like make the best impression are the ones that show up with all their own equipment everything's working like you look like a band you act like i don't mean like a throwing tvs out of hotel rooms band i mean like you you know you you're you're a representation of because at the end of the day you're you're a business and so you you need to be a good representation of that business um and and so by yeah by communicating with people around you um whether that be the sound engineer or the promoter, you know, putting putting a face to the person that they've talked to on the phone, the person that they've been emailing, you know, go up to that person and say, oh, you must be, uh, you know, whoever. Uh, and it's like, I'm Kieran, nice to meet you. We spoke over the email, da, 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 da. you know, and have a conversation with that person. It's not hard. You know, it doesn't have to be life-altering conversation, but just making a connection with that person is, uh, yeah, definitely important. Um, what else was there? Whilst you're 
touring. Um, uh, I think that's everything I've got to say, unless anyone's got any questions or not. Excuse me. No, I don't think so. We have about five minutes left. Uh, okay, yeah, we've got about five minutes left. If anyone has any questions, um, I suppose better leave a minute or two if anyone does have any. Um, but yes, let's just wait. Anyone hits us with a question? Because we elaborate on where people can find you and your music. Uh, yeah, sure, go on then. Uh, so the band in question that we did the tour with. Uh, or my band is called Cold Comforts. Um, you can find us on all the usual social media stuff Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Um, uh, I also just am on Facebook and Instagram. So uh, if people if people have questions after this that they like wanted to ask but didn't want to put in the chat or they think of something later or if someone wants to have a talk about like their application to university or anything like that, um, then feel free, um, feel free to get in touch with me. Cause I happily, like, like a lot of people, I've got so much free time at the minute, happily have a chat with anyone that wants to know about that stuff. Um, uh, Oh, what's this? Also, please explain. Oh yeah. Uh, and I also give lessons online in terms of like music, in, like in, instrument, what's the word? Teaching. I teach music as well. <laughs> yeah. um, so I teach guitar, ukulele, and and drums. Obviously, guitar and ukulele I teach to kids. So if you're a A level student looking to learn guitar, don't come to me. You'll be way better than me. Um, but yeah, if anyone wants any kind of real world tips and tricks on drums, then uh, then just hit me up. Oh, last minute question from Danny. Hi, Danny. Uh, did any gigs fall through? Oh, is in gigs getting cancelled? Um, we had a venue change at one of them. That was interesting. Uh, I don't think any got cancelled um, because most of them were just outright no's <laughs> to, to, to asking if we could play. Uh, oh no, there was there was one actually where so we did two dates in London, one kind of in the middle of the tour, one the last day of the tour, uh, and that was the venue change actually, and it it changed dates as well, which made life just a pain in the ass. Uh, and I think that's just that's just a case of uh, if you're going around booking tours, you need to really be on it with your diary and your logistics and knowing like having everything you're possibly like outside of the tour as well, just having everything you're possibly going to be doing in your diary, in your calendar, uh, and organizing that sort of thing. Like I use, um, Google calendars. It's super easy and super useful to just see where everything is. Um, because one of the dates got moved, which meant that it actually clashed with uh, the date we played at the lounge bar at Alton. Uh, so thankfully, being friends with Catherine, we were able to reorganize that super easily and uh, meant that we could play both gigs. But again, like if we hadn't have had that connection with Catherine, then we would have had to pick between gigs. Would we go for the lounge bar gig or would we go for the London gig? So uh, yeah, having that connection with the promoter of the gig was really helpful because obviously Catherine was very forgiving and able to put us on a different date. Um, but also just being able to communicate with the band members super easily and super quickly that, uh, we could, uh, that we could, uh, you know, like the, the London date got moved. So we were really quickly able to, um, just turn around and say, yeah, cool. We can do the new day. Uh, we didn't have to sit around for weeks thinking like, oh, someone's got on move work and, all this sort of stuff. So making sure everyone in the band is really on it with, uh, knowing their diaries was really helpful. Yeah. Um, let's break the fourth wall. I would actually be nice. There you go. <laughs> uh, Oh, final thing that I just remembered before we finish is, uh, sort out payment. If there is any 
before the gig. That is something I didn't think about, and it tripped us up a fair bit, and I ended up chasing some promoters months into the new year. Like, I think we got some payment, like, in February for a gig we'd done in December, uh, and it wasn't massive amounts of money because we were an opening band, and the band that was headlining had sold out that night. So we knew that there was a lot of money coming in on the door. We tried. We hadn't organized anything before the gig, but I spoke to the promoter when we got there. So basically, this was a problem on my part, and she just kind of said, yeah, okay, we'll pay you, uh, like, petrol money. I was like, fine, that's okay. That's all we need. Like, we just need to cover the cost of getting here, essentially. Um, you know, because you don't really want to be at the end of the tour and be at a loss. Uh and you can't wholly rely on merch sales. So, yeah, organizing payment. I know it's an awkward thing to talk about sometimes. You know, you don't want, always want to say, you know, we're the opening band, can we get paid? But uh, it's it's really important to, to just establish whether you're getting paid and if you are, uh, how much. And, you know, as a kind of low-level band, really don't expect much more than like a... 20 quid note as a bit of a grace gesture but um even that's enough to you know cover half a tank of fuel sometimes so uh you kind of have to put that investment in to reap the rewards further down the line but um yeah i think that's the last thing i had to talk about uh i'm pretty sure uh oh just a sec uh, advice thing Oh, there you go. Beth, uh, on Kieran's mention of payment, I'd advise setting that out in one of your earlier emails from Roger when you're discussing terms of performance. There you go, yeah. So someone that already knows more about this than me, uh, yeah, setting out the terms of payment uh, in an earlier email to the promoter. It's, it's just something that totally, like, didn't cross my mind when I was doing all this. Uh, but that's why that's why we did it. That's why we did it. You make the mistakes so that you can uh, you learn from it. <laughs> and I now know that on the next tour, you know, all these things will need to be done up front. So uh, learn from my mistakes. <laughs> um, cool. Uh, I think that's everything potentially that I had to talk about. Um, yeah. So feel free to get in touch with me. Any any means, any methods, Facebook and Instagram, I'll probably reply the most. But um, cheers for listening um, or watching. Uh, I hope this has been helpful. And hopefully Catherine is on the other end of this call, furiously squirreling away to segue me off. <laughs>
Hello, I'm Connor, uh, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the world of lighting. Um, particularly my experience is in uh, the live music and club events sector. Um, if at any point there are any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and I'll answer them as we go. Um, there will also be, at the end, an opportunity to, to ask questions. Um, so I guess we'll make a start. Um, I'm going to start with explaining the background of me, um, what I was like as a kid. Um, so, as a kid, uh, around the age of 10 uh, was when I discovered that I was very passionate about um, lighting. Um, two people in my life who I'm actually going to give a shout out to, um, my mum and dad, it's their 33, 33rd anniversary today, and they have been two people that have been fundamental to my career. Um, but my parents took me to a U2 concert at the age of 10 and uh, I was absolutely wowed by the lights um, and the production and that was kind of the moment that solidified how I was then going to take steps to basically make a successful career. Um, I've always been quite nerdy, I've always been quite interested in taking things apart, putting things back together um, and just generally wanting to be traveling and exploring and learning new things. So uh, from the ages of <clears throat> 10 onwards, um, I joined a local uh, theater voluntarily at the age of 14 and I was there for about a year. Um, at this point, I didn't really have much technical expertise and they just took me on on the basis of um, I was young, I was enthusiastic, I was keen, and um, I just wanted to participate. Um, around the same time, when I was 16, 17 onwards, uh, I started a live, uh, a live music, uh, a, a live, well, essentially a local promoter um, in Carshalton, an event called Rockstock, and I used to go along and I used to flashlights. At this point, um, was that was probably my first paying job and that was 40 pounds a night um, and it would be turning up at 5 p.m. and it would be finishing at 11. But as a 16 year old that was a great uh, opportunity to have to get experience to work with um, other like-minded people. Um, two of the friends that I worked with on that event um, I still am very good friends with today and they're both individually um, made successful careers out of um, basically where we all started together. Um, onwards from Rockstock, uh, I went to the Brit School in Croydon um, for four years. Uh, when I was 16, uh, I wanted to do production, but I couldn't, so I had to do media. So one of my um, courses was a, a BTEC in media, which hasn't helped me, but after media, I uh, then went into production for two years. And uh, I did, the course was a, essentially it was a te technical theatre arts diploma, BTEC, um, and I completed that when I was 18. And once I was 18, I was then, I'd done lots of networking over, my, over the years. I'd done lots of um, school shows, volunteering stuff, uh, lots of small live music, enough to, to sort of give myself a foundation. Uh, while I was also in college, it uh, was a great opportunity. It was a, being at Brit School was a performing arts school. It was a great opportunity to be around um, musicians. And when I was in college and when I was, you know, late teens, a lot of my friends were musicians, which gave me a great opportunity to be able to go out and and tour once we left. So one of my friends who's actually doing a talk uh, next Saturday on the 5th, Mike Mallion, he's been one of my contacts um, for, well, for the last 12 years. Um, and when we left Brit School, we then went touring together, which was the first, the first of my touring experience. So we were uh, in a... We were basically in an old Royal Mail van that was converted into a band van or a splitter bus. And we would uh, tour all the UK's various clubs uh, doing really 
terrible shows, like really bad shows, but they were great fun. And uh, that was essentially where I then worked from the age of 18 to around 20. At the same time, I was also doing, um, I was also doing crew work. So I was working for crewing companies and the crewing companies are essentially just the, uh, they give labor support to productions. Um, it's quite labor intensive. You're, it's not particularly paid well, but again, it's, it's all about getting experience. Um, after the age of, oh, well, after a couple of years of doing touring, uh, with Mike and, uh, other, other bands in the, in the metal world or the gent world, um, I got my first full-time job and that was with a company called PRG or production, production resource group. They took me on initially um, as a guy to relabel ca cable. <clears throat> so they bought a whole bunch of cable and they needed someone to sit and take sticky labels off and then put new sticky labels on. Uh, I actually found the contract for this job the other day, which was now 10 years ago, um, and they paid me £5 an hour to, you know, do, to do this job. I did that job for three months. Um, because when you're starting your career, it's very important to just really put yourself on the line or put yourself out into any opportunity you can. Uh, so I was paid five pounds an hour for three months. And then the way that the next role happened was it came up as an internal vacancy that they had production technicians and a production technician is someone that will work for PRG full time as I did and PRG would then send me out on the shows that they had booked me or that they had bookings for, they had uh, equipment rental for. So I was essentially just going along and setting up PRG's lights for them. Um, I did that for two years and uh, I'll cover this sort of uh, later, later in the talk, but uh, it was, it was a fantastic basis for me to start with PRG. It was a fantastic basis of using all the experience that I had I gathered over the last, you know, five years or from my, my early teen years to the age of 20, where I could then take it into a professional setting. And it was from doing two years with PRG um, that, that really like give me, gave me the foundation to then progress further. The next part of the story is uh, I worked for PLG for two years, but there was a one-year crossover. Um, this was in summer 2012 when the Olympics was on. And uh, I was I was interested. I've always been interested in dance music. I've always been interested in, in club nights. I've always had a, had a background in generally just being around music as much as possible. And I remember at that point, I also wanted to take a step for my career. I wanted to take a step into a new direction, which was instead of uh, setting the lights up, which is why I was doing this PR for PRG. So I wanted to, I wanted to be the operator. So I wanted to be the guy flashing the lights. Now, uh, a fantastic opportunity uh, for someone who wants to learn how to operate lighting desks is generally in the club in the club setting or for for nightclubs um this is because you get literally you get hours and hours and hours of of time to set up the console and you can play with its various settings and features and you can really get down to how um how it works it's also when you're working in a nightclub uh they're quite fast-paced environments they're not they're not as set up sometimes as clubs and events can be and this and they're really good opportunities to l learn how to do something quickly and to learn how to fix problems uh without people noticing um so to continue on from the story uh, in 2012 i got a call from heaven nightclub in london uh to basically join their technical team as freelance now uh at that point, like I said, I was, uh, I was I was looking for a job to go and learn a new lighting desk, and uh, it was it was a perfect opportunity. So I took that on. 
while I was still working at PRG. And in that year between summer 2012 and summer 2013 um, was probably one of the toughest years um, in my early career. Um, this is because I was essentially working two jobs at the same time. But the reason I was working two jobs at the same time is because I, I was looking to wrap up the two years or to wrap up PRG in one year's time. And I also knew I had, as a freelancer, I had to put myself on the line to say yes to heaven and have a crossover from when I could finish PRG in summer 2013, which is what I did, to then working at heaven more permanently. The plan worked. Uh, and summer 2013, I left PRG and I'm now working for Heaven. And I was also going out with um, some other bands at the time just to sort of keep myself touring. Um, one of the bands was a band called The Magnets and they were an acapella group. Uh, they'd been going for 15, 20 years or so. Um, so I was a, a very young guy on the crew. You know, I was touring with, with people in, the, in their, their mid-40s. But it was a very sort of like family um family group it was very it was it was really good fun to be with people so experienced and they they are very grateful for took me all over the world i i have a a, a really positive experience of uh going well, a positive review of going to china for three times um not a place that i would have ever thought i would end up but i was 23 24 at the time um and i had the experience of going down more or less the entire east coast of, of, of china um to every strange city that i've never heard of or can say that i can even remember um <laughs> from working for heaven and uh the magnets and various other bands it got to around 2015 where I'd done two years with Heaven just as a technician and the head of lighting at the time uh, was moving on and Heaven were looking for a new head of lighting. Now, this is kind of where things really changed for me because uh, I was basically headhunted to be the new head of lighting for Heaven. And I, I, I held on to that job uh, until January this year. And uh, the experiences of working in a place um, that you really like being in. So I really like being in nightclubs from a technical perspective. I really enjoy the events. I enjoy, like I said, the, the, far, the fast paced nature of it all. It's also a very challenging environment and it gave me a great opportunity to, uh, to learn how to manage a team. Not something that I'd ever done before, but I was kind of determined, uh, determined to just challenge myself. Um, so I did Heaven for, for five years, uh, and as I was working, I was working self-employed throughout this, this, this whole time, um, it also allowed me to go and work, uh, with other bands. So I, uh, another point I'm going to reference in here is, 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 is networking. Uh, when I was working at Heaven, I, it was a great opportunity for bands to come into Heaven or for artists to come into Heaven or more relevant for technicians and other lighting guys uh, that I would book to work on the, on the, on the club nights. Um, one of the contacts that I made at the very start of my, my Heaven career was a guy called Miles Weaver. He's the lighting designer for Muramasa, he's the lighting designer for Nao and a couple of other bands. While I was working at Heaven, Miles would also send me out on his tours because we worked together at Heaven. We knew each other's, um, we could trust each other to, to how we'd program the desk. Um, and that's, that's kind of been the basis of people that I've always worked with in the past are still now here in the future and it's always just been a case of networking and it's not like you go out of your way to purposely network um it is recommended that you do that but the people that i now work with just so happen to be that are people that I, I started with you know several years ago i hope that makes sense um that's kind of taken me up to to, to this year and this year is um 
has been a, a, an exceptionally strange one. Um, so I left heaven after working there for seven, seven years. Um, I decided it was time to move on. Uh, I found myself getting just a bit complacent. I wasn't really challenged anymore. I, I, I knew the place inside out. I had a good team of technicians and I was willing to kind of step down and, and move on. Um, the story for the beginning of this year is then I left heaven. Uh, I had a couple of other bands that I was working for. So I went and did a, a tour with Muramasa and I also went and did a tour with James Arthur um, on behalf of the lighting designer called Frankie McDade, who's very lovely. Um, but when we were out on tour uh, at the beginning of this year, the shows started to get pulled and it got to the middle of March and we were all sent home. Since March, I haven't really done much lighting. Um, Heaven have very honourably kind of taken me back on back on board, even though I left, uh, I left on very good terms. And it's been of great benefit to uh, be able to have them around and to be able to go back to Heaven. Heaven is kind of now operating technically as a restaurant or as a, as a bar instead of a nightclub. Um, but there's still a requirement for me for me to be there. And that's allowed me to just kind of get through through this year my my main ambition is to, to to go back out touring at some point but um as to anyone that's watching this uh touring is probably uh got a big question mark next to it for for the foreseeable so it's kind of just now sitting tight and seeing what will happen um i will cover a bit more about the networking side of thing um for for, for my experience and probably for um generally what happens in the industry so networking is probably one of the most important things um as part of a self-employed freelancers lifestyle um it's kind of <laughs> there's no there's no day which isn't really a work day and that's purely on the basis that let's just say you're in between tours um you're home for two weeks but you've been invited out to a show um to see one of your friends who's lighting who's, who's light is lighting an artist you would go along um because you want to see your friend like their show but then it's also a fantastic opportunity to meet some of the other crew that will be on your friend's show and networking happens in a very sort of um in a very organic way. It's a very social ex so, social experience. Um, maybe when you finish a job, uh, you, you get booked for, for a lighting, for, for a lighting, you get booked by a lighting hire company uh, to go and work on a production. And then they say, oh, we're all gonna go to the pub afterwards. Going to the pub afterwards is always a good thing, uh, as long as you can, you know, keep, keep control. But it's a good opportunity to network because that's when you really get to know who's doing what shows, who's doing um, what productions. And when you're talking to someone, you generally find that people go, oh, yeah, I know that guy. I know that guy. I know that guy too. Um, and it's, it's, it's a way of sort of putting yourself amongst other people um, and getting familiar with exactly who does what. Um, networking has been pretty much the entire basis of my of my career from the early days where i was networking with the local theater where i was networking with the local band night to then networking in the brit school to networking um in my crewing career and uh going on festivals with the magnets um then moving on to working in heaven having people come through on shows it's just, it's it's a it's a constantly well, yeah, it's 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 a constant, just not need, but it's the constant motion of just always talking to people and always being around people, and it's 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 hugely important. It's it's probably one of the the most the most important things to to, to making a successful career, and it might it kind of reinforces the phrase, it's not what you know, it's who you know, um, because I can definitely say that for myself. <laughs> um, I would also cover, um, let's have a quick look. Um, I'll kind of go through a couple of, a, a couple of proud moments and a couple of tough moments, um, to highlight 
how the job can be it can the job as a lighting guy essentially is depending if you're a technician or you're an operator um is to light the band to light like the like the event make sure that the client whoever has booked you is happy um and sometimes things work out and sometimes things don't um my working life has been uh quite challenging at times at the very start of the career was probably when it was most challenging um and it was challenging because it was working quite hard it was working quite hard for something that you wanted to be involved with but it was always quite difficult to be involved with sometimes um in the, i can probably explain that a bit better by by saying it's important to really put yourself, like I mentioned earlier, to put yourself on the line and to try and volunteer as much as you can, uh, to try and not worry too much about how much a job is when you're starting your career out. Career out. I was fortunate enough to have my parents support me uh, as much as they as much as they could, and I. Were, I, I was able to earn forty. I was able to agree to you know doing a job at forty pound and then just working towards and building, building up um, my 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 rates. But with over time, is it's when the the money comes and the money shouldn't be the basis of why you do the job. Um, it, it never has been for me, and I I don't I don't think it, it it should be for anyone else. Obviously, it's very important. Everyone needs money to live, to pay their their, their living expenses. Um, but at the start of your career, it's 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 important that you're doing your networking and you're building yourself for your for, for essentially whatever is next. Um, a couple of proud moments for me. Uh, the the moments that I've really gone, wow, this is great. Um, was when we've had Rita Ora come through heaven. She came through to do an album release, and it was a half an hour club show. So we had a, a nightclub packed full of people. I was asked by their production manager to bring in a lighting package on their behalf to program and set it up and run it for the show. Uh, and that was a very rewarding experience. Um, Earlier on in my career, that was probably around 2018, earlier on in my career, um, I had the, the privilege of working with Danny Minogue. Again, this was through Heaven. Um, Heaven, for those that do or don't know, um, Heaven is a nightclub in central London in Charing Cross and runs the GAY events. Um, predominantly, it's based on um, the commercial pop music sector and uh, that's where a lot of my experience has mostly been. So uh, Danny Minogue came and performed on the, it was the Pride event of 2015, 2016. And uh, the owner of the nightclub asked me to be involved. I lit the event on behalf of Heaven, but then Danny went to do the Manchester Pride and I traveled with Danny on her tour bus up to Manchester uh, and lit her show which was exactly the same as heaven but i then lit the show as well in manchester um there's been other rewarding moments where um this one is probably both rewarding and probably part of the, the tough moments list um was being part of the, the the 2012 olympics this is when i was working for prg um it was exceptionally rewarding to be part of a production that was a well globally known you know the, the olympics are, are huge and being early in my career at the age of 20 21 um 19 even i was it, it, it was a huge experience to be involved with you know such with well, be involved with professionals that are working you know at the top of their game the olympics is is for many people probably a, a, a talking point on their on their cv um being that i also said that it was part of the tough moments with every career you have your moments that really shine for you and you have your moments that are moments that you really go what the hell am i doing and the olympics was probably one of those one of those moments um that was because it was 
in the early start, it was very long hours. It wasn't great pay, uh, as I've mentioned with, with other experiences. It wasn't great pay. And I really had to commit myself to wanting to get to the next step or to wanting to improve myself. Um, it was, I, I remember I, when I was working on, on the Olympics, it would be sometimes we'd be going back to back on productions. So we'd be going, we'd be in the Copper Box basketball arena, you know, from midnight to 6 a.m. Um, to do some TV lighting. And then from 7 a.m. to midday, uh, we would then go and do adjustments in the O2 arena um, for the badminton or whatever event was, was in there at the time. But it was quite hard graph because this was sometimes during this was the points that i'm referencing now is actually during the during the live broadcast and the lighting designers wanted us to just update some stuff so we had essentially a live court below us and we'd have to climb up into the ceiling um you know all with ppe personal protection equipment um and harnesses and clips and we'd all have to be trained trained on how to climb across roofs and we would be literally hanging from the ceiling at you know five six o'clock in the morning um for, for for 12 hours and i i really remember just one time just knowing that i had to get through it um knowing that it wasn't forever and knowing that um you know i'm paid to do this and it's i should be you know privileged to be part part of it and i was i was it was exhausting though um the other uh tough moments in my career was when i was learning to be a manager for heaven um i hadn't really had any managing experience uh i was 23 24 when they gave me that job and uh, it was a case of, as I explained earlier, I'd worked for him for two years and then I was given the manager's job. I was headhunted for the manager's job. And it was a case of I needed to learn how to build a crew of technical staff, how to manage freelancers. Um, managing freelancers, by the way, is a completely different game to managing uh, a team of full-time staff. Um, it's usual for uh, for nightclubs, particularly, to have full time staff. So they'll have, for example, um, let's just use Ministry of Sound in London, Elephant and Castle as an example. They would have, prior to the pandemic, of course, uh, three full time technical staff, and those three full time technical staff would be able to cover sound, lights, and video, um, and they would they would always. Uh, look after the club and they'd always be there and occasionally when um when needed they would drag in or they would hire in rather not drag <laughs> they would hire in a um another freelancer to support their team heaven operated on a very different a very different basis where the entire technical team um which is more usual with live events as well the entire technical team will usually be freelancer or freelance based uh with heaven uh managing freelancers you have to find people that are passionate that want to be there and um are willing to work long hours so a, a, a heaven shift uh, by default will between 10 well, between eight to 10 hours. Sometimes there's been days that I've been working at Heaven for 18 hours, 19 hours, 20 hours a day. For example, when we do the, the, the New Year's, the New Year's Eve, um, the New Year's Eve event, or the Pride event, or Halloween, ooh, Heaven has always gone out of their way to really put on a show. Um, or GAY Heaven has always got other ways to be to put on a show, and as a technical manager, it's my responsibility to make sure that all those criteria for that production are met. Whether it's uh, lights, video, um, sound, um, I haven't. There was a separate sound guy, but I would have to work or a sound manager, but I would have to work with him to make sure that if I was playing video for the LED wall at the back of the stage, that would have to tie it in 
with the sound guy and he would um, I mean, it's fairly, it's fairly self-explanatory, but you'd have to work as a, as a, as a team, and we would have re- rehearsals in the afternoon sometimes for these things. And it was, it was important to for someone that hadn't managed a team before to be able to learn how to manage. Um, let me just have a quick look at my notes. I think uh, this might be a good point to actually talk about um, the design process and what jobs fit into the well, what jobs fit into a production essentially. Um, I myself has have worked as a lighting designer, and I've worked as a touring lighting director. I've worked as a technical manager for a club. Um, I've worked as a an operator. And I think those four things has pretty much been the basis of my career. Um, in addition to that, on the technical team, you've also got the production manager. You've also got the the sound team. Um, I'm not that familiar with sound, um, but you'll have the sound operator and you'll have a systems tech as well. Um, you then also have uh, the tour manager, and from a from a technical point of view, that's probably the basis of a sort of middle size show. When you then get into bigger events, you might have lasers, you might have pyrotechnics, you might have video, and each of these disciplines have their own department. Um, saying that, it's sometimes not unusual for uh, for a lighting guy to take on pyrotechnics, video. Uh, and lighting, of course. Uh, when I was working at Heaven, I was responsible for those three things, um, whereas the sound were just responsible for the sound. So uh, let's just talk about the production manager. Uh, the production manager talks to the entire technical team, and the production manager then reports to the tour manager. Tour manager looks after it the entire tour, whether that's band and technical, the production manager just looks after the production side of things. So the production manager will be familiar with anything sound-wise, anything stage management. They'll be familiar with all things that are going on with lighting. They'll, the production manager will be the person that will basically understand the concept of the show. They'll understand... Um, how each component fits, not necessarily how each component works. Um, so the production manager won't necessarily be a lighting guy, but the production manager will know how to talk to the lighting team and he'll understand some of the points. If, let's say, the lighting team are having an issue and they say, we have a moving light that's not working, the production manager will, will understand what, the, what a moving light is. Likewise, if uh, the production manager is talking to the stage manager, um, the stage manager will say, okay, we need to spike, which basically means means marking um, objects on stage. So if you have a chair on stage and it needs to go back to the same place, you spike it. The production manager would understand the term, okay, we need to spike it when the when the stage manager is talking. So the production manager is basically like the, the overseeing eyes of the technical aspect of, of productions. Um, this is the case in corporate it's the case in tv it's the case in basically all events you you won't necessarily have a production manager sometimes it's left to the individual te- technician to look after just their, their their one discipline um but on bigger shows obviously the more production the more people it's 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 easy to have a production manager as the one point of contact um for everything then let's talk about the uh, the lighting designer and the lighting director and the operator. Now these can either be one person doing all three jobs, usually on smaller productions, or uh, on larger productions. <clears throat> on larger productions, you actually have um, two people covering these roles, in, split up in different ways, or on even larger, maybe like TV shows. Um, and stadium tours and arena tours, you might have um, three people covering these roles. Now, the, the the lighting designer is responsible for 
the visual look of it. So the light designer will say, okay, well, I want some lights in a line here. I want them to be pointing at the 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 the, the downstage centre or the the vocals in in the middle at the front of the stage. I want them to be pointing the lights to be pointing them, and I want them to be red. The light designer is the visionary behind what you're seeing. The lighting operator would then be the guy that's listening to the lighting designer so the lighting designer isn't necessarily standing at the desk this is in reference to bigger shows um the light the lighting operator would then listen to this input from the lighting designer and be the guy that physically points the lights and makes, makes it work um the lighting director um is slightly different where if a production goes out or if you're on tour but the lighting designer is not there. The lighting director is basically the acting on the road designer. But on bigger shows, the show would have already been designed uh, before it went out. And then the lighting director basically just looks after it on the road. So the lighting designer does the visuals. The operator does the inputting of what the lighting designer is saying. And the lighting director is the person that would then tour with it usually as the operator as well. Um, you would then have, as part of the design process, um, in reference to what, what we've just talked about there, we, the, the design process would be uh, the lighting designer would talk to, let's just say, a band. Um, I'm going to use Muramasa as an example because that's what I've been involved with in the past. Um, Miles Weaver is the lighting designer and I've been the tour director and the operator. Um, Miles will talk to Muramasa and he would say, okay, well, I've got this concept. I've listened to the album. Um, I understand this is what you want from the show. The lighting designer and the artist will go back backwards and forwards and basically build an idea together. Um, and not necessarily a, a lighting idea, but a, an idea of how they want the show to look and what, uh, if there are any special moments in the show that need attention. Um, this would be the same for theatre. So if, if it's, it's sort of like getting down to bullet points, um, important parts for the show, any specials, any um, special effects or anything of detail, the lighting designer would then go away with these notes and they would design a lighting rig uh, on software. I'll cover software um, after this. Um, they would design a, a rig or a lighting setup in 3D software um, where they could also print off plans um, and they would then take the, like 3D renders or they would take computer generated Im images of what the rig would look like back to the artist and say, okay, well, this is this is the idea. Sometimes they might even do a, a, a demonstration. So um, they would do, using the 3D software, you can plug lighting desks in and you can basically um, have a visualizer. Um, some, whoever's listening to this may be familiar with visualizers, some may not, but for those that aren't, a visualizer is um, a piece of software that allows you to visualize well, the clues are really in the title, I guess, but uh, it allows you to visualize what the lights would look like in, uh, well, what the design would look like in, in real life. Um, you can play, you can plug lighting desks into these visualizer, in these bits of visualizer software and essentially control the lights as if they were real. Miles, using our example, would go back to Muramasa and say, here's some, here's some designs, here's some visualizer ideas. Uh, what do you think? At this point, it would go backwards and forwards and it would basically, the details would be thrashed out about exactly what's right and what's wrong and how things need to change. At that point, this is all months before a tour has even started. Um, the design would be confirmed and if once the design is confirmed, it would then, depending Depending on budgets, you'd then either get a, a lighting hire company involved. So a lighting hire company would be the people that are supplying, um, usually that we call them floor packages. Um, they'd be supplying the lights that go on the floor. Um, when you're touring, you have either, you, you either have a floor package, so just lights that you put out yourself, um, or you don't. Um, but 
most venues will already have some lights in the ceiling. Some don't. It, to, to keep it, to keep this, um, to keep this example simple, let's just say we go into a venue that does have lights in the ceiling, and we bring in our floor package. Miles, once the design has been confirmed, would book the floor package, which is included in his design. He would book the floor package with a lighting hire company, and once that's all booked and confirmed, we would then. Uh, talk to venues that we're going to and say, look, we're going to be bringing in some extra lights. They're going to sit on the floor. Can we know what power you have available to plug our lights in? Can we know what lights you really have in the ceiling so we can work out if we need to bring anything extra? Um, it would also be a case of saying, okay, well, we're going to have uh, special effects. So we're going to have a, a, a smoke machine or we're going to have... Um, I won't use pyrotechnics because that's not quite in the world of lighting, but let's just say um, special effects like a low fogger, like a dancing on ice kind of like fogger kind of thing. Um, that would also that would all be advanced to the venue, so the venue and the actual production, um, which was part of this is this was kind of part of my technical management job at Heaven as well when productions came in was the two the band and the venue or the technical team for the band rather, and the venue would talk together um, and basically say, this is what's happening. Can we bring this in? We want to have special effects. Is that okay? And everything would be confirmed. This is what, th at this stage, this is what we call advancing and basically um, pre-production um, to make sure that when we actually turn up to the venue, everything is run smooth. Using the same example of, of, of Ramassa and, and Miles as the lighting designer and me as the, the touring lighting director, um, Miles and I would then get together maybe a week or two before uh, the show starts. Sometimes when big productions, it might go on for months. Um, but you, we would then use the visualizer software that we use to sell the idea to the band, the artist Muramasa in this example. Um, we would then use that visualizer software to start programming the lighting show. Um, and it's, it's, it's a fairly straightforward process. Uh, we would sit in a room, um, we would listen to the music, we would have listened to the music, you know, obviously during the design process um, or just for our own enjoyment. Um, and we would sit and listen to the music and we would quite literally, with the desk and the visualizer, program how the lights are going to work. Um, what they're going to look like. And it's a case of just working through uh, and building a show um, in advance, if a, if a, if a, if an artist says, okay, well, we're going to tour, uh, two albums, um, that's going to be 20 songs. You would program 20 songs when you turn up to the show, or uh, when you start doing the, the, the tour, you might only end up doing 15 songs, but those five extra songs have already been programmed and you can then use if the artist wants to change the set list and so on and so on. Um, our, our process as part of Muramasa was um, time coding everything. Now, time code is is it's it's a it's a tool that lighting uses. It's a tool that sound, pyrotechnics, video. A lot of people use it. I don't think I'll particularly cover it unless um, unless there's any questions to do so. Um, but time code is, is basically a way to synchronize um, lots of devices that are running the show together. So um, it allows them to all essentially at 10 seconds uh, do something or at 15 seconds. So they all know where 15 seconds is, they all know where 20 seconds is, so on and so on. It's a really handy tool and we would use time coding to basically get the lights to do what we wanted to do, to get the lights to do what we wanted to wanted them to do um, in time with Mirror Masters Music, in time with the song. So. Um, let's just say, for example, um, at, at, at the end of uh, 30 seconds in, the intro finishes and the verse starts. We would have a lighting state on the lighting desk that would then change the lights for the verse. Um, at 45 seconds in, uh, the um, chorus would start and we would have another lighting state that we would assign to 45 seconds and so on and so on. And uh, it's... That's quite a, a simple explanation, but uh, it can get quite complicated in how you assign things um, and how and how we did for Muramasa. So essentially, when the show was actually running, um, the lighting desk was just listening to the time code and was triggering the lighting cues. Um, 
based on you know Mary Russell performing and the songs being played. Uh, that's that's usually one way that the bigger shows and the bigger arena and production and um, uh, stadium shows are run because there's so much going on. It's important to keep the timing. However, um, there's also shows that don't have time code that can be very complicated and will physically rely on someone standing at the lighting desk and pressing the go button and making the lights physically flash. Um, going back to the design process, so we would be sitting, putting all the uh, all the lights into the visualizer and we would be programming the lighting desk to the time code. We would then basically run through um, the show with the visualizer um, a few times and make sure it all works. Um, the way that we would set the set the desk up would mean that when the show actually goes out onto the production, all we'd have to do is make sure that the lights that we've programmed in in the um, the lights that we've programmed in the show file as part of the pre as part of the pre-production um, happens in real life essentially. So it all ties in, and when we've gone working in the visualizer, we've worked with dummy lights we call them um and we assign those dummy lights to real lights in the, in the real world it basically means that you design an entire show in a computer and then in real life the physical lights are there and you just link the whole thing together so when you are then operating the desk it then operates as, as the visualizer did um once the show is then on the road um you would either have a lighting technician um, and the lighting director, or it would be the same person um, tying in back to the the part, parts of the technical team. So the lighting technician, if you're lucky enough to be on a tour where you've got a lighting technician and then you're the lighting operator, as I was uh, for Muramasa, the lighting technician is the guy that's responsible to be on stage uh, looking after the power, looking after the data for the lights, looking after if there are any faults, let's just say a strobe light breaks or I can't control it, I would speak to the um, to the lighting technician and I would say, okay, I'm having a problem with the strobe on the right hand side, can you take a look at it? Um, that would be, that's, that, that's a nice position to be in when you've got someone that's on stage and then you're at front of house. Front of house being at the back of the room where the lighting and sound desk would be. Um, for my job as a, as, a, as a lighting director, Miles had already designed the show with me uh, in, the pre, in, in the visualizer before we even left to go on tour. Uh, I would now be there understanding how he's built the show, understanding how the, the, the console has been programmed, and I would be basically the acting lighting lighting designer. He, Mars, wouldn't physically be there. Um, it would just be my responsibility to carry on, it sounds in a funny way, to carry on his vision and to make sure that all the shows look exactly the same and if and as and exactly as they need to um sometimes the lighting designer would be at the shows um to basically see that it has all worked and that i would he's not necessarily there to, to check that i'm doing the right job but the lighting designer needs to be sure that that the programming in the desk is right and that, and that what's happening in the visualizer does look like what's happening in, in real life. Um, some tours, however, if you uh, get booked, um, I did a tour for James Arthur at the beginning of this year. He booked, well, James Arthur didn't do but the production manager booked me um, to work on behalf of Frankie, the lighting designer, and I was the lighting director, but I was also the lighting technician. So I was responsible for making uh, the light the lights flash from the desk and also had to help plugging them in. There was one other guy, it was quite a large production this, we had lots of um, LED sets, so we had large set pieces with uh, LED strips down the middle and we had uh, probably an extra uh, 30 lights to plug in and, and to set up every day. Um, and it was important that 
I was also working as a lighting technician to make sure that the show was loaded in on time and it was all set up and it was all working. But it was also important for me to, as soon as the lights were all set up, to then go to the desk and start making the show look to start making the show look as though it's meant to be or how it's meant to be rather um and once the show is essentially on the road uh once it's touring it doesn't really change um this example that i'm giving you now is kind of in the in the in the professional world and in and, and how the, the workflow happens um when you're doing sort of like club tours and you're doing smaller shows, you might not have, like I said, you might not have a production manager, you might not have uh, a separate lighting technician, um, you might not have a stage manager, and you might be responsible for setting the lights up, doing, flashing the lights, packing it all down, helping load the truck as well. Um, it really depends on the size of the production um, and how much resources can be budgeted for, but it's it's all it's it's always good fun it was good fun <laughs> has been good fun to uh to be able to learn it all myself i've i've individually i haven't uh, i haven't acted as a production manager as such i've act, acted as a technical manager which is slightly different um but i have worked as a lighting technician and i have worked as a um as a lighting director and I have worked as a lighting designer and that's been really handy for me to be able to understand um, kind of like how how they all fit together or how these roles all fit, all fit together. Um, I would also just take, probably take this moment, I, I kind of covered it earlier about, about networking and about when I was talking about volunteering that it's, it is, I, I think I have definitely covered it, but it was, it's very important to basically just try and say yes to as many things as possible um if you are really dedicated to to doing the job that you want to do if your job doesn't feel like a job and it's just a passion for you um just throw yourself in really just throw yourself at it and in, in, in every way you can and it, you'll you'll get a far better experience um than not basically putting yourself out there. Um, maybe that's just from my own experience and, and some people might feel otherwise, but I, I would say generally of the people that I've worked with my entire career, I have always been very passionate about what they do. Um, it's always been um, the dedication to working long, at long hours and having a good sense of humour. Um, it probably make a make a good point to then sort of go on to talking about uh, touring lifestyle and the mental health side of things, um, because touring can be hard. Touring can be really really hard. Uh, it can also be a hell of a lot of fun uh, to say. So not to scare anyone off, but it can be a long time away from the people that you love or things that are familiar, um, and your you can essentially sometimes land on tours. You can be booked for tours where you don't know anyone. Um, there were occasions uh, where I would go out on tours. For example, when I went and did this James Arthur tour at the beginning of this year, um, I didn't know anyone on that tour. Uh, the people that had been touring with James Arthur had been touring with him for you know five plus years. I was just stepping in to to, to help Frankie out. Um, and it's really important when you're on tour to try and um, be there is definitely well, to try and be as as nice of a person as you can and to try and be uh, nice and friendly and chatty. Generally, what you would find is people that get booked for tours have already networked quite a lot. They've uh, they, a lot of people have said, oh, yeah, this this guy's a good guy. And even when I was recommended to Frankie um, by one of my close friends, he also knew Frankie and he knew the production. So he basically made the rec recommendation that, yes, I, I would get along with people. Uh, I have touring experience and it's, I, I can be trusted to be put on a tour bus with 16 strangers and uh, for everyone to still get along fine. Um, being in part of a touring family is you uh, work with these people, you socialize with these people, you... Uh, explore new cities and new towns with these people, you travel with them, you um, share the same tour bus, you share, you know, uh, 
your 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 living accommodation. It's um, you're with these people all the time. Um, some productions you'll be best friends with the band. Usually smaller productions. Um, on larger productions, the technical team will be one party, and the the artist and band team will be another. Um, the James Arthur and Muramasa tours at the beginning of this year were the artist and the technical team all on one bus. Um, and it, it, it means that you really get to know who you're working with. And it's and it, it can be really, really good fun. And 99% of the time, it's people that you work with on tour are lovely people. Um, the the people that, you know, won't or have been out on tour and, and haven't got along with others are usually the people that then don't get recommended for future tours. All the other people that don't get recommended to go and work on um, high-profile events or to go and work with, you know, smaller teams of, of, of people or smaller productions that require, you know, that they require people to to be happy to be able to be committed to the long hours to be, and to essentially just getting on, getting on with the job. Um, so it would be kind of important to um just be a nice person just be a nice person and being on tour uh it can be tough of course because if you're working long hours sometimes you might not get to eat and particularly in my own experience when i don't eat i get quite grumpy but i know that and it's i i, I try and manage it when i'm touring in a way that it's not to take it out on on other people um also, you can have times on tour that you don't sleep very well because you're doing really long hours or you are you don't get a chance to actually, like, um, to actually go to sleep in, in a bed. There's, there's been uh, experiences, experiences in my past where uh, I've done, uh, I've travelled to a festival or travelled to a show. Um, on, on a Monday morning, I've done a show in a different country on a Monday night and the Tuesday morning I've flown back home. There's been no hotels. It's literally just been fly there, do the show and come back. Um, sometimes those kind of, those kind of, uh, those kind of circumstances might happen back to back. So you'd fly to one show, do a show on a Monday night, Tuesday morning, fly to another show in another country, do a show Tuesday night, Wednesday morning and so on and so on and so on. And it can be exhausting. Um, some productions will uh, will provide accommodation and some productions will understand that, okay, well, we need to look out after our technical team and they're going to need at least four hours sleep. It's, it, 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 is, it is like that sometimes. Um, but that's to, to talk about what I was talking about earlier, weighing up your proud moments with your tough moments. The, the proud moments should, should really make it worthwhile. The, the tough moments are just the nature of the touring, touring world. Um, it's just the nature of um, how the job is sometimes. It, 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 it can't be another way. I, I, understand that, um, I understand that a lot of people... Um, I just lost my flow, one second. <laughs> uh, I understand that a lot of people will think that the touring world is very glamorous um, and that you get to work with artists, you get to go to, to countries, you get to explore everywhere. Um, and yes, that is the case. It is, it is a very honorable job to do. It is a very um, privileged job to be able to work with uh, people that are talented, people that are um, love love traveling as much as you would um have you know similar interests and to be able to, to to see the different different parts of the world um the reality of it is um sometimes you'd go to countries I've, I've seen more the inside of more venues than i have of countries for example um i flew to japan uh, during this uh, during last summer this was for Muramasa and he was booked to do a dj show and it was just, it was a small team. It was me, the artist, uh, his name is Alex. Wonderful guy, love working with him. And one of their managers, a guy called Harry. So it was me, Alex and Harry. And the three of us flew to Tokyo. We got there really early in the morning on a Tuesday morning, let's just say. The Tuesday night, we then had to go to the, um, where the show was being hosted and we had to basically check everything, make sure it all works. And then in the nighttime, 
the Tuesday night, we would then do the show. The Wednesday, we would then sleep. And then the Thursday morning, we would then leave. So sometimes we're flying to, you know, destinations, 14-hour flight away, and you're only there for two days. But you're not there to explore for two days. We, we luckily had the, had, had the privilege of being able to spend three, four hours just to go for a wander. But you've flown all the way to Tokyo and you're only there for realistically uh, three hours. Um, some other experiences that have been probably quite rewarding, uh, but also quite demanding, was back in 2015, uh, I was working in Australia. I was working on the, this is when I was working for the Magnets, I was working on the Adelaide Fringe Festival. And at the same time, my good friend Mike Malian was uh, with his band Monuments and were doing the Soundwave tour. Um, so I, went to Australia for probably just under two months. Um, and I worked on the Adelaide Fringe Festival with the Magnets, and then I went and did a few weeks to festival touring with, with Monuments. Um, and one of the toughest moments was finishing all that up, and then I flew directly from, uh, from Adelaide in South Australia, um, straight up to 40 hours later in Finland in a um, town called Kittala, which is in the Arctic Circle, um, to basically go from uh, 30 degrees plus to minus 10, uh, all in the space of a day. Uh, that was uh, an experience where I was working with Tesseract. They were one of the bands that I also used to work with. Um, also lovely guys, and I have, I've, I've always loved touring with them. Uh, they did a production where... Jägermeister wanted to do. Um, Jägermeister wanted Tesseract to perform on top of an ice hotel um, in, in in the Arctic Circle uh, in Finland. Um, I can't. I'm trying to sort of explain it better, but it was a. Um, sometimes uh, brands will ask bands to promote them, or there will be a sponsor. And the Jägermeister basically sponsored uh, Tesseract to go and do a, to, to do a show. Tesseract asked me or wanted me to then uh, do the lights for this show. The, there is actually the, the, doc, the Tesseract documentary for Jägermeister on YouTube. Um, and that was probably one of my most honorable experiences um, to go through the first you know, three months of, of the year, going from two months of the year, rather, going from you know, touring in the summer in Australia to doing festivals um, to then flying all the, all the way to, to Finland. But that was pretty much back to back. And it was a, it was a, a direct flight. Um, part, part, probably part, part of the production for, for Tesseract as well was uh, that was all advanced. All the advancing for that was done more or less on flights uh, around Australia as I was flying between the festivals. Um, I'd be having to sort of sit and I'd be having to draw plans and like come up with ideas that when I then got off the flight and I went to the festival, I could then focus on the show that I was working with in Australia. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a constant, and it always has been, it's just a constant um, balance of trying to stay one step ahead or trying to stay two steps ahead if you've got the time. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that uh, the current circumstances have really taken away that, um, that fast paced lifestyle, uh, which I love. And a lot of, a lot of other technician friends also really love. Um, but that's, it will, it will come back. And I really do, do hope it will come back. Um, I was also covering um, the touring earlier on the, 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 the touring lifestyle. Um, I just covered briefly the, the mental health side of things in my own experience. Um, I understand that the talk after me, um, Lena Lenman at 3 p.m. will talk a lot more about uh, the mental health um, of the music industry, um, but I'll cover it just briefly from my own experience. Um, I think anyone watching this uh, will will know how important mental health is in, in, in life. Um, it's, it's important in life, in your own personal life, but also in your working life. And the, 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 the touring music industry, 
maybe can be viewed as uh, a lot of it can be viewed positively and negatively. These days, it's got a much more positive, uh, positive persona, where the the people that are going out touring are uh, they look after themselves, they eat well, they try and exercise, they try and sleep well, uh, they don't drink lots, they don't um, get involved with illicit substances and all sorts. In the past, maybe in the seventies, eighties, nineties. It was more um, it was more usual for technicians to to be participating in these uh, in these this this kind of like party lifestyle, and it can definitely get that way. And uh, I think it's very it's very easy when you're on tour um, for the party lifestyle to kind of like take over. You know, you finish a show, and in the dressing room, there's a you know a crate of fifty beers, and every night you're you're going in. Um, you know, you just have one beer, two beers, three beers, but then you start to lose the, the, the sense of kind of what is Monday, what's Tuesday, what's Wednesday, and you're just, you're drinking every night. And uh, it's, it's needless to say that I, I have people in my own life that, that go touring and um, there's nothing wrong with having a party, but it's, it's the ease of being able to, party basically every night and that can really start to affect your mental health and that can really start to affect your performance on the job and that's when um people then sometimes don't weigh up uh how they are on on you know how they perform when working to you know no way up against how good the party was last night for example um usually on productions that i've worked on now you know people People have fun. By no means am I saying you know go along and be be a square by any sorts, um, or don't be a square. Um, but it's it's important to basically look after yourself and to keep healthy because when you're not sleeping and when you're not eating properly, um, it's probably very easy to also just start drinking and and you know being involved with with things that won't benefit you. Um, like I said, Leonard Lemon will probably cover this much better than I have, but I just wanted to raise it as a um, as a point of my own experience and from what I've seen and experienced myself with other people. Um, it's just really important to look after yourself. You know, you're away from home. Um, sometimes you you can be away from home for one month or, or two months, um, and if you're if you don't like being away from home or you're or you're missing someone the the last thing that you really need is is extra influences to make that harder um i mentioned earlier um when we were talking about the visualizer side of things i mentioned earlier the 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 visualizer and the software um i'll just use this next section to cover um, some of the software that is used, um, and I can also cover some of the hardware. Um, some of the hardware, you may actually be surprised what I would say is important to have as part of the touring technician. So software-wise, um, you've got lots of different ones. It's um, Some are more expensive, some are cheaper. If you're a student, um, the cheaper option is to go for, there, there may be ones here that I'll mention there may be ones here that I don't know about, but if there are people that do know, you know, other other options, please please mention them. Um, the one that I would say is a good starting point is one called Capture. Um, if you just go and Google and type in Capture Lighting Lighting Software, um, that was where I kind of first started, and it's got the ability to plug in a lighting desk. It's got the ability to um, design in the 3D space, and it's also got the ability to draw plans to give to venues. Um, you've got Capture, you've then got another one called WYSIWYG, which is, uh, how, do I, how do I spell WYSIWYG? It basically, what it means is what you see is what you get. It's the anagram for that. Um, WYSIWYG lighting, lighting software, that's usually used by the um, it's usually used for the live events industry, but like the top end of the events industry. It'll also be used for major TV shows, major productions. Um, WYSIWYG is much more um, featureful than Capture. Capture is, is a really good 
um, starting place. Uh, Wizard Rig is probably where you where you move on, but Wizard Rig can also be very very expensive. Um, you've then also that's sort of covering the the, the live events world um, in theatre. Um, they would use uh, Vectorworks, um, and there's one more which has just escaped my mind. But Vectorworks is is another uh, design piece of software. Um, essentially does the same as the other two, but has different features. Um, if I think of the fourth one, I will mention it randomly. Um, then moving on to the uh, design side, um, I'd probably say we'll probably be wrapping up in about 10 minutes, as this will probably be the, the, last, the last topic from me. Um, on the design side, uh, sorry, on the hardware side, my bad, um, You've got laptops, you've got USBs, and the one that you might be surprised is luggage. Now, um, on the laptop side, uh, when you're designing, um, you want a computer that's powerful enough to um, to run the, the 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 software. And essentially, if it's if it's doing a visualizer, that could be quite uh, graphics performance demanding. So you want to get a laptop to that's got a good graphics card. Um, I can't make any recommendations myself, um, but I've always been a user of um, MacBook Pros. MacBook Pros have really solid graphics. There are also the Alienware computers. Um, there's also plenty more out there uh, that, that you can use. Um, not wanting to go into computer specifications because that's kind of beyond lighting for me. Um, one very, very fundamental tool as part of a lighting director or a lighting programmer is um, USB sticks. Now, USB sticks are your backup to um, to basically making sure that you always have your shows backed up and your lighting data is never, ever lost. I have had one time in my career which uh, I was really stung um, by not having shows backed up. Um, and to this day, I still remember it um, in the way of the way that I now go, go through my process of using my USB sticks and backing up shows relentlessly is because of that, that one mistake that I, I, I made in the past. Um, it's worth saying that if you do make mistakes, um, you would probably be, if you're in the touring world, you'd use it as an opportunity to learn. Um, when you're starting out in your career, you'll make a lot of mistakes. I made far more mistakes than I did do things right. Um, <laughs> and that's a really important part of your, of your progress is not necessarily understanding it as a mistake, but using a mistake as a learning opportunity. Um, that's that's kind of that's kind of one of the ways that, that that you build yourself. So USB sticks, without a doubt, just back up, back up, back up, back up, because computers cannot be trusted. I tell you that. Um, also, lighting desks can't be trusted. Um, another part that I would say is part of the the hardware of touring is 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 luggage. Now, um, you might also hear musicians cover this and uh, various other people from the touring world but when you have your entire life essentially or everything that you need uh, with you on a tour for months um, say you lose that bag not even to say if you lose it say if it gets damaged say um, you decide to go for a cheap suitcase that's got everything in it and then suddenly it gets thrown on a flight get gets thrown off a flight but when it's thrown off it busts open that can be really really inconvenient you can lose things um so invest in good luggage is probably one of my pieces pieces of advice here again i can't really recommend what is good luggage because i'm not a, a luggage connoisseur i have no experience in selling luggage but basically if you can you kind of get what you pay for, and it's definitely worth investing in something that will last um, rather than something that will be cheap and might break open. Um, uh, just want to think what else in, in, in hardware um, that would be, be important. Um, USBs backing up, good laptops. Um, 
keeping keeping stuff in the cloud is always is always a good is a good way. So you've got um, iCloud, you've got um, Dropbox, stuff like that. Making sure that even if you lose your USBs on tour, say you lost your bag, uh, that it's backed up somewhere else. Um, and that's 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 probably the the extent that I would probably cover that. Um, I'd say at this point, if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Um, I think while we wait for any questions to come in, or if I just have a quick read. Um, uh, um, the difference between working in a stationary uh, in a venue between being on tour. Um, so one of the reasons that I, I was quite happy to take on um, working in heaven was because it allowed me, it was, kind of, it was, more, it was more of a lifestyle choice um, than, than, than anything else. Um, heaven allowed me to uh, earn good money, uh, because I wanted to save for a mortgage so I could buy my own flat. Um, when you're touring, um, the idea of owning property is quite irrelevant. Some people I know um, go basically from tour to tour and don't own a house. Um, it saves a hell of a lot of money on living costs, but it also means that you haven't really got anywhere to call, to call home. Um, so I didn't really fancy that. Um, I like having my own space. I like having um, somewhere to live and somewhere that I can essentially just store my stuff. Um, so I opted for working at Heaven so I could be in London and so I could see my friends more and so I could um, have essentially a life. Um, when you weigh that up against touring, touring has you away from home quite a lot. It has you um, away from family or friends. It has you working long days. Sometimes uh, you might not even get to be able to make a phone call um, to to your family, friends, loved ones um, because the airport Wi-Fi doesn't work or because you're in a country where there's no 4G or you, there is 4G, but it costs £15, you know, a megabyte or something insane like that. So you, it's... You have to want to be on tour, I would definitely say. Um, it is great fun being on tour, like I have mentioned, but it's it's the, the, the difference between working in a venue and working on tour is touring can be quite demanding, as can working in a venue, but a venue allows you to be at home but still work on productions. When I was working at Heaven, uh, we had, a, I, I couldn't even begin to name, but 200, 300 plus bands have been through heaven, you know, in in the time that I've been technical manager. Um, and it's allowed me to see a lot of different ideas, you know, listen to lots of different music, um, meet a lot of people, back to the networking thing, meet a lot of people. Um, you, 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 you can network in both touring very well and you can network in, um, in, in venues very well. Um, but it's really down to personal preference. Um, some of my close friends have, have done the same as me, where they have been uh, on tour. The, the touring lifestyle has been good for them. It's, uh, it's, it's made them, you know, very, very comfortable. Um, but you sometimes might get to the end of a touring, touring, touring period where um, you think, OK, well, uh, I've been on tour for 10 years. Now I want to spend time with my family. Now I want to be around my friends. Now I want to be able to, you know, have a Friday night off kind of thing. Um, that would that would ultimately be um, the difference between being at a venue and being being on tour. Um, if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, otherwise, uh, I think that might be all from me. Uh, thank you for watching. And uh, if there are anyone who um, has any further questions, please contact either Lounge Bar Alton or, or Kat and 
please do get in contact. Also, do watch the, the next one. That will be about the mental health, Lemon Lemon. And also do watch Mike Malian next, uh, next Saturday, and he'll talk about online streaming. Uh, it's great what uh, Kat and Lambert Alton are doing here, and uh, I really hope this has been helpful for people. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Hi. Are we alive? Nice to meet you. Um, my name's Lena, and I am a performer and out of work due to COVID performer. Um, I have been asked by lovely Catherine to come here and do a little talk on mental health in 2020. What a year. Um, so here I am, and it's lovely to be here, and I hope there are some people watching, uh, or maybe you'll be catching up at a later date. Uh, so I work as a burlesque performer and a vaudeville performer um, in generally. I've been doing that for um, 10, 12, 14, potentially 16 years. I'm not sure. I'm getting on a bit. Um, I've been doing it for a real long time and I'd finally gotten to the point maybe about a year ago where it was finally my full-time job. It took a long time working up to it. Um, I worked I worked full-time job alongside it and then that sort of petered out and part-time, a couple of days a week. And then finally I was performing full-time um, as well as producing shows um, and little bits of photography as well, all kind of intertwined. Um, and then... I felt like I was just about to blast off into space and like just have the best time ever and then uh, COVID hit and here we are. So um, it was a bit of a, I'm trying to think of a word that isn't shitter because this is a professional platform. It was, it was a bit of a, a burn, let's say. Um, and and I had to, as, as well as all of us, we all had to think of ways to, um, try and keep on going and keep positive throughout the year so that's what I'm here to talk about and I'm, I'm no expert like I don't have any mental health qualifications but I'm really lucky to say that I have really good strong mental health generally um, I'm a very positive person um, and I tend to find the good in most things obviously I've been having some ups and downs this year um, but I'm, I'm gonna just I guess talk you through how I managed and, and my friends managed as performers to get to get through this. Um, so we've we've had a little look um, at it and made a little five little bullet points that we can talk about. And uh, my first bullet point number one is um, is to channel your creativity. And I'm a massive believer that creativity and art in its many forms um, is a is a is a brilliant way to to just channel your emotions and your feelings and and just keep yourself vital and keep other people vital and questioning things um so i mean i'm just talking from my perspective because that's that's what i am i'm just me um all of a sudden my my creativity was cut off what i do is i, I make my costumes i choreograph dances and skits and comedy and songs and then I take them on stage and give them to people. And I suddenly couldn't do that at all. I haven't been able to do that um, since March. Uh, <laughs> um, so suddenly that was all cut off and I was just kind of like bombing around the house, missing my friends, missing my job. Um, luckily I have a really nice husband who lives here with me and he's also very creative. Um, so we got to bounce off of each other but it was just a massive part of my life and most people had a massive part of, part of their life cut off um so for a long time i was just sort of yeah bumbling around the house like thinking what to do and then and then one day i just started to dress up <laughs> it sounds really silly i um i found some a big bag of old bandages um that i used for one of my characters on stage and i wrapped them around myself and addressed like Lulu from Fifth Element and and I suddenly thought oh oh this is really fun like I get to play dress up and I shared it online you know in your Instagram stories and I started to get lots of feedback from people who had seen it and thought it was really funny and and then I I did lots of these so I dressed as Lulu I dressed as David Bowie it just it just kept going on and on and it got more and more silly and but as I did it I kept getting messages from people um it was really lovely saying how it it was helping them like just giving them a lol um just something silly to take their mind off like the crudeness that was going on so that was a really nice side effect but at the same time i was still able to to sort of do something creative um so whatever it is that you do like maybe you knit or like maybe you play a guitar or sing like you just got to keep doing it even even when you feel like you can't create something maybe 
maybe use someone else's song and just sing their song. It's not yours, but well, in, in a way, like if a song's been put out into the in the world, it's everybody's song, isn't it? Um, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I really, 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 really think it's super important to just keep those functions moving and. And it can come in many forms, like creativity doesn't have to be painting a masterpiece or writing, like uh, Jump by Van Halen. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that classic. It can be really silly, um, such as the, I call them crap cosplays because they were just an ultimate in crapness. Um, so yeah, that's my first point is just find a way to be silly and create art of any form um maybe well I, I could sit here like listing all the ways that you could create art maybe make some sculptures out of twigs in the garden but truly do that um <laughs> so that's my first point um and my second point is uh is how important it is to talk to anyone i am um, I'm a big talker <laughs> usually and actually it wasn't for a long time um, my husband taught me to be true about my emotions and tell people how I feel and um and be honest so now I just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk um but I I instigated weekly kind of meetups with my friends under the guises of working out this is on zoom during lockdown still going on um so I had maybe like four different friends and we'd meet on a Monday, some of us and throughout the week and work out. But before the workout, there was like the 40 minute chat section. Um, <laughs> this was the best bit um, where, and sometimes it would start really, um, I'm, I know this, I feel like I'm teaching my grandmother how to suck eggs, like you know how to talk, but sometimes people find it difficult. Um, sometimes we just start really um, innocently oh how you doing oh yeah everything's fine and then like it would evolve and then maybe a little tear would come and then actually start peaching your eyes out and realize that I'm not okay today and um, and I just need to talk and talk and, and you don't have to reach any massive conclusions but just talk about how you're feeling like why why you think you feel this way maybe you'll find out why you do by expressing that with a friend um <laughs> uh so super important to talk and super important to let yourself have a cry if you need to um and so many people i think men in particular um are men are told they're taught their whole lives aren't they not to cry not to show any kind of emotion so i, I do really feel for um the men folk of the world or, uh, well, and all all the people who've been brought up like that, but I think particularly as men, isn't it? Um, so yeah, super important to let yourself cry and and give yourself that space, and and give your friends that space to to be able to let out those emotions if they need to. Um, and I think if it's something that you don't usually do, like when you finally let yourself, it's gonna feel real good. <laughs> It's gonna feel real good. There's always that. Um, I'm not saying I sit here crying all week. <laughs> I probably have a cry like once a month with my friends. Um, <laughs> um, but where was I going with this? Um, yeah, it, it it feels awful when it starts to come out, and you feel yourself trying to stop it, and then you get that headache. But then when you finally let it out and just accept that it's absolutely fine to have a weep. You're gonna feel grand, babes, <laughs> grand. Um, okay, so here we go. Where am I going to now? Ah, oh, yeah, okay, set yourself goals. Really nice. Um, I mean, there wasn't really much happening for the whole of the year, and, and, and when, when I'm saying set yourself goals, I don't mean like, um, goals to, to be going out somewhere and meeting people and, conquering Everest I mean like little goals like around the house so um like even tiny little lists I always write a list at the start of the day <laughs> I want to get these things done and they cross them off and sometimes like if you think of other things or if you do something by accident I'll just write that one across it off so it looks like I've achieved more but anyways um set yourself little goals whether it's like do a workout have a bath spend some time reading a book or like cook an epic meal um it, they're just little things, but, but, and it sounds really silly, I, I guess, um, 
but just even knowing that you've achieved like three little things in a day awesome so good um so yeah i set myself the goal of becoming um a fitness instructor it's pretty it was a pretty big goal but i figured um i mean in lieu of having a job um and i, and I kind of figured i'm not going to have a job well it's all up in the air isn't it we don't know when we're going to be allowed to perform properly again um i'm going to have to find a new job and and being a creative person i spent a, like many years not knowing that i was um an artist and just working jobs just to pay for my, to pay for houses and working for the weekend basically then when i finally realized that it was it was viable to be an artist and a performer and this and this is a job that you can do um then uh, uh oh no oh no have i just corpsed again um <laughs> where was i even going um setting goals yes finding myself a new job so <laughs> i realized i don't want to go back to the rat race i want to keep being a creator and doing my own thing so i uh, set myself the goal of becoming a fitness instructor to be able to teach kind of theatrical 1980s style workouts to people um 80s culture is a big passion of mine so it all ties in uh so I, I did an online course you can find loads of online courses and a lot of them are really reduced at the minute there's loads of black Fla black friday black friday black friday deals going on um so if there is something that you're kind of thinking about um doing at the minute have a little look because you might get an ace deal um so i i took out an online fitness course and i spent i think three months doing it, it was really hard i'm not very academic um but I reached that goal and I passed it. So now I have a new job, um, which is quite immense. And, and I mean, it's it's slowly building and, and things are slow build when you're doing them online and trying to, trying to do things in the virtual world instead of the real world. But there we go, set yourself a goal. Um, don't be too hard on yourself. Like don't think, oh, I have to say, you do buy yourself a nice course after this little chat on your 35 percent off black friday deal um don't feel like you have to do it in a certain time let it spread out and take your time organically you're going to get there in the end um okay so um next up all right i think it's my last point and and i guess it ties in with my goal that i set myself and it is stay active and i'm not trying to sell you my fitness classes but if you do want to join they're really fun um but <laughs> it's staying active and exercise in general is well documented to 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 reduce people's stress to reduce anxiety um to improve your brain function to improve productivity um and not only does it do that for your mental health it also is really good for your insides and, and i think it's really good to not work out i don't, I don't want to sound like i'm preaching but it's <laughs> it's I, i'm not saying you don't have to work out to lose weight or to look better like exercise and working out is really good for your insides for your brain and all your heart muscles and lung muscles and the things that keep you alive um so uh, stay active even if it's just like a walk you know Boris said we could go out for a walk and sit on a seat if we wanted we could sit on a seat apart from people um, go for walks jog up and down the stairs a couple of times get that heart rate flowing and and even like get some YouTube workouts up they're hard and during it you feel like you want to die but afterwards you get that lovely afterglow and you get that feeling of having achieved something that could be your goal Tick. um super important to be active even in just little ways stretch out like stretch your body just do some like silly little poses and you'll feel like muscles working like you haven't used before <laughs> i know it sounds silly but um i really believe that um exercise and creativity very important um and i feel like i'm kind of on my way to stop blabbing soon i wonder i think we've done this really fast um i don't know if there's been any questions if anyone's even with me um i don't blame you if not um i think there might be a question coming in so um 
when I've had days where I want to stop entirely, how have I built up from that again? Thank you for the question, whoever that was. Um, I, well, first up, totally cool to have down days. Like if there's a day when you just want to lie on your butt, do you lie on your butt? <laughs> you lie on your back. <laughs> your butt's involved. Um, if you want to just lie on your back for a day, totally cool. Um, and I think allow yourself that every now and again. I think it's um, really good to be able to do that. Um, yeah, I guess there are sometimes days where you feel like that, um, even for a positive Pam like myself. Uh, I think I've found... I, because I haven't had a job really for the, for the last few months and I, and I think having the goals has made me get up and keep going like knowing that I've had this course to finish um and knowing oh god I've got to get up and answer like five more questions on the skeletal muscle system um <laughs> even though it's super not that fun um just knowing that I've got that to tick off um I think that's what what's helped me personally um so get yourself writing some lists <laughs> and uh, so, unless there are any more questions, the dove, the dove from above is talking to me. <laughs> Come on. Hmm. Um, so, uh, as a performer and promoter, we're looking at uh, getting back to normality and how that will work and, um, in terms of confidence, uh, <laughs> I think we're just going to have to play that out. And I mean, as a performer, it, it is your job to fake it till you make it. So even if you're not feeling confident, um, and you don't 100% believe in your project, you, you have to kind of pretend that you do if you're selling something to the public. So I sell, um, the thing that I sell is escapism, I guess, and entertainment um, with my 100 Watt Club shows. Uh, so the audiences come in and they spend the evening laughing and forgetting about the world. And, and really that's my job. Um, that's what I need to focus on. So even if I'm feeling like I can't do a good job of it, or maybe it's not going to be as strong as it was because we haven't done it for so long. Um, I have to just pretend that it is. And, and, and I think that goes a long way. I mean, that's a, it's a whole thing about burlesque performances. Like I can get on stage and I can be full of flu and have to pretend that I'm some kind of like sensual goddess. <laughs> uh, I just have to fake it. And, um, and so I think that's what I would advise is just pretend. If you don't believe in yourself, pretend that you believe in yourself and just do it. You have to. <laughs> yeah, so um I'm gonna I'm gonna head out in a minute um and make a nice cup of tea. But if people wanna find me online and you're welcome to message me or anything, um or just have a little peruse. Um I have a few Instagram accounts you can find my show 100 watt club at 100 watt club 100 watt club you can find my personal page which has my modeling and burlesque work and lots of oh, all the crap cosplays you'll be able to see those if you go on a little scroll it's at lena may lenman that's lena m-a-e lenman um and if you want to check out my 80s workouts not saying you have to join but you should um it's solid gold fitness solid underscore gold underscore fitness um it'd be really nice to see you and if you have any further questions or anything uh you can drop me a little pm on there and uh, we can talk so um i think i'm gonna head out now unless the dove from above has anything else to uh, feed into my ear <laughs> we're all good um, it's been really nice to talk to you uh, I hope it's been of some help I don't know if it has but even so it's nice to hang out so take care of yourselves and um, be good
Cool, thank you. Uh, so, hello. Um, thanks, Catherine. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, songwriting. It's a massive, massive, massive topic. Um, and I will say now that there are no rules. This is just the way that I write songs. Um, and it's been going okay for me, going pretty well, actually. Um, so, yes. And before I carry on, if people could, people who are watching, if you wouldn't mind dropping your, um, in the comments section, your interests, like musical interests, genres, uh, the kind of music that you play, or um, sort of maybe even your standard as well, so that I don't end up talking about something that might not interest you, or, well, I'm going to try and make it all linked, uh, whatever style, but... Um, yeah, so that I don't end up, I don't know, going too fast or anything. So that would be good. Um, and it would be nice to get to know the peeps who are watching, of course. Um, so the first thing about songwriting, maybe I should go on a little bit about what I've done in the past. Uh, so I was at Alton College, uh, I say a few years ago, but it was a bit longer than that. It was about five years ago now. Um, and I did the live music workshop, uh, BTEC course, uh, amongst the other music courses. Um, and it was great. I met uh, Catherine at my time there, and we got to do some gigs at Lounge Bar. Um, and that was when I really started to experiment. Well, it was where I started to feel like my music was... Well, I, I was at the point to really write some songs and, and release them. <clears throat> um, um, so I released a, a project in, like, 2016, I believe it was, which is... Yeah, that's four years ago. So... Uh, that was kind of a chilled album. It was sort of a mixture of my sort of home style, which was a bit more blues, a bit more relaxed kind of music, um, which I actually did partially at college, at Alton College, and uh, partially at my house at the time. And um, that was a very interesting process. Um, I'll get more a bit onto context and process and stuff later, but um, recording music and writing music in different locations is always an interesting uh, and quite inspiring process, I've found. Um, and then when I, I left college and had like a bit of a gap year and uh, got PR, and, um, and, then I, and then I put out another project which is a bit more electronic, a bit more dancey um, and I, I got a bit more into production as well which I would recommend to anyone looking to write songs it's always good to um, especially if you're a bit picky because I'm quite a um, bit of a perfectionist sometimes and um, I've worked with producers but uh, now I really like to just have full control so learning to produce is is a excellent um, an excellent thing to get to to get to terms with um, so this yeah then I put out another album which is a bit more electronic um, and then moving forward, I did a handful of singles, which were kind of very varying in style. Like um, I put out a song called Luna, which was kind of influenced a lot by hip hop, uh, even though I was still singing and playing guitar. Um, so yeah, I, I play the guitar and I sing. That's like my main, well, guitar is my main instrument. And uh, I've kind of had to learn how to sing over time um, to kind of accommodate people not turning up to rehearsals. So uh, kind of grateful for that now. Um, and then this year I put out uh, my third album, Everything is Temporary, which is a bit more R&B. Um, again, quite production heavy. I was, I was trying to kind of create um, quite a, a mix of styles of R&B through to, whilst kind of staying true to the, the roots, like my sort of, I don't know, original style that I was really into was blues. I feel like a lot of my guitar playing and, and sort of songwriting is based around sort of blues and jazz. Um, and then, but then again, the production can completely turn the track upside down. You can write a jazz tune, but if you put like a, a hip hop beat over the top or a boom bap, it can just completely transform the song and suddenly you're kind of looking to send your song to like our, a hip hop or R&B playlists, even though it's very much jazz influence. Um, so that's kind of a little, I've done lots of gigs over the years as well um, with my band and with other, I've, I've worked with quite a few other artists who write songs and I've been playing for them. Uh, a band called Old Swing, uh, we're on Spotify, uh, well I'm not in the band anymore but um, <laughs> like we're on Spotify so you can take a listen. Um, it's all good, like, by the way, I, was, I wasn't kicked out or shunned or anything, it was... Um, well, yeah, these things happen. So, uh, and then I'm in another band called Flood for the Famine, and that's run by a guy called Alex, Alex Linder. 
and uh, we've just put out a couple of singles actually. Uh, one of the singles is called Corona Days, which is great, and that was produced by a guy called uh, Pete in the Hair, who, who's worked with quite a few big artists and stuff. Um, so yeah, songwriting is, is quite a big part of my what I do. I, I play for other people and love writing my own songs and putting stuff out as well. Um, so then I went to uni. Um, well, well, uni was during the album actually, but um, I studied popular music, so we covered a lot of experimental stuff. Uh, I was at Goldsmiths, and um, yeah, we we were really pushed to kind of push uh, put ourselves into new contexts, which I think had an interesting sort of effect on my songwriting because now I don't often try things that I'm so comfortable with. Um, it's always good to be sort of trying uh, stuff that puts you in a bit of a different context. Um, so that's. Um, let me just have a look at the comments real quick. Okay. Mm. So, right, songwriting. It's such a massive subject, it's really hard to know where to start. But songwriting, basically, you're going to need... The methods of writing songs always change. They're different for everybody. It's a completely subjective experience. Um, how I write a song might not be how you write a song. Uh, but I can share a little bit about the process of how I write songs, and it's sort of um, always flowed nicely. I, I don't often choose to work on songs properly unless I really feel a spark, and I don't really know how to describe what it is that makes me feel that spark, but you will always know when something's worth chasing because it, it makes you feel a certain way. Um, so, yeah, if I... I was to write a song, or the way I've been doing it, um, I have a couple of different ways that I've been doing and writing songs for the last sort of three, three or four years. Um, usually, the songs that I like to work on start off with me and the guitar. Just that's where it starts. I come up with uh, usually a chord progression or like a riff, and then my vocals come around the riff. So I work my vocals or the melody first around. Um, the sort of like whatever I was doing at the time, it could be simple, it could be a little bit more complicated. I always try and work the melody around the guitar parts because I, as a lead guitarist or as a, a guitar nerd, I like to have my guitar, I like to have important guitar parts. So I, I like to have a balance between the vocal and the and the sort of, and then the guitar parts, the sort of more mid range other other stuff that's a bit more mid range as sort of in the mid frequencies for those who don't know about uh, sort of ranges and stuff like that. Um, so I'll have an idea, I'll have a melody to go over the top, and this is a bit weird, and not a lot of people I've heard have done this, um, but like I kind of tailor the lyrics around the melody that I hear in my head. A lot of it, again, is quite hard to explain because it's just sort of something that flows and it's hard to pinpoint exactly what happens. But usually I kind of tailor the lyrics around the melody and then the subject of the song comes like right after that. So after I've got like a main hook or like something that I like, it could be a bit of a verse or a bit of a chorus, just something that I want to like chase. Um, that then just sort of ends up flowing and I might not even write another part, it might just sort of remain that one idea and then um, like I'll, I'll give an example, for example back in like five years ago um, when I wrote this song called Take Me To The Sun, it's just three chords, uh, I don't know, this is good, it's just G minor to F major and then to C, well C dominant seven and the chords do change throughout the song, but not very much. I mean, instead of going from G, it goes to, from, uh, from B flat. And there are little differences that I notice, and a lot, I don't think a lot of, it's not like, a, if I was to jam this at a jam night, I wouldn't be telling people all of these chords. I would just tell them the chords, because you can play the whole song with those. But there are always these little differences that I put in because it, it's, it sort of marks a new section. So the verse is just this, and then there's a bit of a pre... Well, the verses are actually just ordinary C major. But uh, in the choruses, I like to create a little bit more tension by adding in the flat seven, which makes it more of a, a little bit bluesier. So that was kind of what I was referring to with the whole blues influence thing. Um, so... <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you.
I've lost my notes. Bear with me. Sorry, I'm switching between Chrome and Safari. I don't know why. Um, so, so you want to write a song? You let's say, I, yeah, it would be good to sort of know what level people are at, so I know what to talk about. But I'm going to start pretty basic and see, and slowly work a little bit more uh, complicated. Um, so, say you've never written a song before, or maybe maybe you've put some ideas together, but you're not entirely sure where to take them, or you don't know. You know, you're a bit overwhelmed or something. I think that one of the most important things to do is to have a pretty basic understanding of harmony. I think it's pretty important these days. Maybe it wasn't back in the day. Um, I, I know that arguably it's not essential because you know you've got people like Kurt Cobain and stuff who, who, who you know, if you compare them to a musician of these days, you know, there's going to be a bit of a difference in knowledge, which is not always a bad thing. I mean, look at where he ended up. Um, <laughs> But um, so I think having a basic understanding of, of harmony is a good um, is a good start. So I've got um, my my blackboard behind me. I hope this all looks all right on the other end. Um, so I'm going to be a professor. You can call me Professor Baker, whatever you whatever you want. So let's just whenever we're talking about harmony or or music, the the easiest key to talk about is C major because C major has no sharps or flats. It's a pretty smooth key. So, how's that? Um, Catherine, can you? Is that all right? Can you see that? Yeah. All good. Maybe I'll do it a little bigger. So we're just going to write out all the notes in the key of C major. So this is just super si super simple. C D E. Oh God, I hate the feeling of this chalk. Oh, C D E F G A, and then B. We can put C at the end, it doesn't really matter. Um, on Minuto. Is this mirrored? It's not. Okay, that's good. Um, so then what we're going to do is, so we have the key of C. Uh, it has seven notes, or eight notes, including the octave, uh, which means there are going to be seven diatonic chords in the key, which means if you want to stay within your key, there are seven chords. So if we go C, we're just going to label them. Let's make it a little easier. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, okay. So the first thing we want to do, if you don't know anything about music theory, is we want to find the first chord. If we're in the key of C, the first chord is going to be C major. So one way to understand what's inside the chord is by doing this. Move along a note. Um, skip a note, and then do the same again. So we have this one, three, five formula. So not only do we now know that the first chord is in the key of C is C major, C, E, and G, but we know that to form a major chord, uh, you literally just need, uh, well, you need a one, a three, and a five. So you can just make a side note here, one, three, five. So you've got the one, major third, and five. So then we do the same thing with all of We need to sort of shift the numbers, but I'm not going to do that. Um, we just need to do the same with all the other chords. And what you end up with is a pattern. Um, so we have C major is the first chord. The second chord comes out as D minor. So we're going to do the same again. D, skip one, F, skip one, A. So D, F, A is your next chord. So that's going to be, so we've got C major, um, D minor, oh, that's a, that's a B, one second, D minor, same again, E, skip one, G, skip one, B, E, G, and B. Uh, that's going to give us an E minor. I'm not going to do all of them because you can work it out. But um, as I said, there is like a pattern. I'm just going to have a sip of my wine. Um, I said to Catherine that I'm, I'm an hour ahead of the UK, so it's acceptable for me to have a glass of wine. Um, so as I said, there's a pattern that emerges, and I'm going to squeeze it in here, way up here, over here. And the pattern is M, well, big M, small M, major, minor, minor, I've got to be careful, I'm going to run out of space. Major, minor, minor, major, major, minor. And then right at the end, the last one's a bit of a bitch, minor, flat, five. 
it sounds a little scary, but it's not so bad. It's no different to a C major in the sense that it's it's just three notes that are put together. All it means is that for this last chord, we've got a flat five. So instead of a one, three, five, it's a one, flat three, flat five. So minor means flat three, and then flat five is obviously what it is. So we have this pattern. So if I just go through these chords, like play the most basic form of the chord. So the first thing we have is C. So that's very nice. You know, that's kind of all you need for a song. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> um, so then we have, D, we have D minor coming after, and then E minor, and if I just follow, I'll just play them through. And then the final uh, minor 7 flat 5, you can play here, or I'll go through the... It'd be also interesting to know what instruments people play so that I don't go too crazy with the guitar. But anyway, so we know that chord 7 is like a little bit jazzy, a little bit funky, and then back to C. And that's just, that's just everything that's diatonic. Uh, so that's all the chords that belong to this key. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're like limited. We certainly don't want to be limiting ourselves to only these chords. Um, but let's limit ourselves just for the next couple minutes for this next example. So if we're going to, let's just think of a song like, um, I can think of any song like Waves by Mr. Probs. It was like a gym hit. I don't know. If I just transpose that into C major, uh, if it's not already in C major, I think I like it's in F minor. So let's go. So that's just using very simply uh, diatonic chords. And by diatonic, um, in case I just didn't say it earlier, I think I did. It just means that it belongs to the key. Um, so we've got A minor. I was just going to play that song. So that A minor in the key of C would be number six, because if we're going C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, uh, six is A. So we're here. This is A minor. G. So in the key of C, G, chord, uh, G is chord five. And then E minor. So from in the key of C major, E minor is our third. We've done that here. So we've got, and then and then at the end we have F. So that's chord four. So all you need, it's just a kind of root fifth. It's actually what we did here. So we've got just root uh, fifth and then third. Or maybe you can't even. Yes, you can see. So we're going like one five three rather than one three five. We could do both. Uh, sorry. What is it? Uh, it's you know whatever you whatever you choose, but um, so that's just super simple. There's probably loads more pop songs that are using those chords as well, um, but for me, like it's it's cool and it's nice, and th there are plenty of ways you can spice that up. But for me, it's just a little too bland. Um, I don't I love pop music. I think it's incredibly important to have a like a really broad uh, like taste in music and I think it's also important not to just completely shun anything that comes out in the last couple of years because as we know there's an amazing amount of music that comes out and that's popular um, you know so for me it's a little bit too like bland it's a bit too basic I feel like it's something I would hear on the radio um, so I don't know if I wanted to spice it up maybe I would suggest not using chords that are diatonic so I don't know. Another thing that we can do, I could do with a cloth actually to clear this off. But um, what we can do is we can borrow chords from other keys. You know, so if we have C major, um, and then this is our sequence. Um, if I was going to be playing guitar over the top of this and writing a song, I'm assuming they probably sort of were like. I don't know. If I was playing guitar over this, I would probably make this a little bit more, mm, I don't know, find a bit more tension. So, so the second chord, instead of a G major, or whatever it is, it's supposed to be a dominant. Maybe I could play a dominant chord instead. And then it's kind of leading into back to chord one. So I'm thinking maybe it could just be something... 
and that's that is just a C major at the end, but it's just a little different. Instead of doing a one three five job, we're doing a one three five seven. So we're doing the same thing as we did. This is another. I'm going to move on now because I've been talking about this for too long. But um, and I also don't know where I'm going with this waves example. But the point is, you can um, find other ways. You could have to stick to the key. Yeah. So um, I'll quickly explain the whole seven thing for people who don't know. If you find that you're sort of stuck just playing like the same chords, you can find other ways of just making chords a bit more interesting and, in my opinion, a little bit more fun to play as well. Um, so instead of just having one, three, five, I mean, a lot of people know how to play a major seven chord, but they don't necessarily know what it is they're doing. Um, so instead of just having one, three, five, we've added in a seven. So one, three, five, seven. And by doing this stack thing, you basically layer a load of sounds and you create these interesting extensions. So instead of playing a C major seven, we'll just, well, sorry, instead of playing a C major, you can play a C major seven. So even though it's still a major chord, a lot of people think that minor chords are sad sounding and major chords are happy sounding. But in my opinion, this sounds sadder, sadder than this. That sounds a little spicy, a little bit um, inviting, should I say, I don't know. Um, so, yeah, and then you can keep doing it as well. So just to get a bit more complicated, I did say I was going <laughs> to speed up my um, the level a little bit. Um, so you, you can obviously build these chords in this way where you can just completely, it's basically all the chords are, it's just sort of patterns. Um, so you, we can add a nine. Um, so instead, so the, and the 9 in the key of C would be a D, so instead now we have this, which, um, and I, this, I'm certainly not saying that anything like all songs need to have extensions, because I, I don't want to be the guy that just plays everything as complicatedly as possible, because I think it's, it's very important to have space and, and to have simple chords sometimes, like going back to my song I was playing earlier, Going from F, sorry, G minor to F to C, um, I could have easily gone like C major nine with a sharp eleven or whatever, but I just liked the the clear sound of a C, just going having that E in there is important. Um, so I could have easily played like something super funky. Uh, but I don't know, it's interesting, it's good to have simple chords sometimes, so I'm certainly not suggesting you go out there and just like play every pop song with as many jazz chords as possible. Um, but, um, so instead of just playing an ordinary chord sequence, I mean obviously this will take a bit of practice too, it's not just like playing pop chords, um, it's, it, it will require you to learn other shapes and stuff, and this isn't just for the guitar either, this is also for piano um, and I don't know, all instruments really. Um, so I'm going to move on to a different example now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, just going through progressions and linking a melody to a progression and how you might start forming ideas that, uh, ideas on the guitar and ideas on the vocals that like interchange and interlink. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to find a progression. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm going to grab a cloth, um, sip your coffee or your beer, or in my case, my wine. I'm going to grab a cloth. I'll be two seconds. I'm going to wipe this off and get cracking. <clears throat> All right, very sorry about that. 
So I'm going to pick out a progression that uh, I thought would be interesting to find, well, to, to look at what's going on with the melody. It is one of my songs, so I'm going to promote myself in the process. <clears throat> We're good. So the first chord of the progression, um, it's not entirely essential that we go through the chords, but if you're interested, I'll write them out anyway. Uh, so first chord. Uh, I believe. Yep, first chord is an F major 7. To an E flat major 7. Um, okay, it's a little bit jazzy, I won't lie. Is that seeable? Visible? That's a Hendrix chord. We've got a D7 with the sharp 9. And then this is like a little passing chord. It's the, sort of the same thing, but just not. We've got a flat 9 and... Oh, dear. Sorry. Flat 9 there instead. So we've got... And then... And then I wanted to kind of step a bit outside my comfort zone and find a way of not going because that sounds nice but it's a little too friendly I wanted something a little bit weird the song is actually it's called Kaleidoscope and it was supposed to be a little sort of trippy um, so I wanted to kind of and then lift instead just I don't know none of this is diatonic going back to the whole diatonic thing earlier it's good to work out and write out chords in this way but it's also good to just completely experiment with with all kinds of stuff um, so I could probably work out where I got the the A minor from but it's just honestly it just sounded I just thought it sounded good so that's sometimes the way and then it repeats uh, and then the second time and then it changes but we'll just look at these chords for now so Say someone's just sent you this progression, and then you need uh, you need to find uh, like a top line. You, you're being hired as a songwriter, and you need to find a top line for these this progression. And it's a little bit out of it's a bit weird, so it's a bit hard to think of how you think of it. Like now, this is another topic actually. It all depends on how you visualize things. So if you're a person that visualizes the sort of uh, melodies and harmonies uh, in relation to scales, that's cool. Um, this, like if, you, if you're thinking scales, that's good. Um, but you can also really free up your playing and your ideas by just like not thinking about any of that, just kind of more f following the sound. So um, it sounds so, but it, it really is just following. So when I, when I had this chord progression, I had this chord, so we had, so I, I wanted to establish like a, a kind of key or somewhere that felt relatively comfortable. So the notes that stuck out to me, um, I'm going to, I don't think I did do the key thing, I think it was a different progression, but, so I had these chords. And I, the notes that were sticking out to me were these top ones. So I was thinking, right, it's quite high. Maybe I'll drop it down. So maybe I should play where uh, where it is in the song. So the main progression is. comes in Doo -doo -doo. that just kind of stuck out to me Doo -doo -doo. I beg your pardon it's actually this note that stuck out to me so I wanted to go Doo -doo -doo. whilst these two chords are transitioning so Doo -doo -doo. and then I, f I could hear the I could hear the uh, 
that I could hear that I could go up more. So, do 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 do. I thought that was a little bit. When I play it like this on an acoustic, it was kind of something that like sad John Mayer would have written from like the 90s or something. And then I had these chords. So I kind of naturally just followed the the notes that were moving. So these notes were moving. Um, and then I wanted to just completely go a little crazy and play uh, this note, sing this note, but whilst having it having the A minor there. So that's what it felt like it should be doing. But I I wanted to sing this. So, <laughs> I beg your pardon, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 sorry. Sorry, that was the one. So, yeah, it created an interesting layer of, of sounds. Um, but basically the idea behind it was just, just follow the notes of the chords, you know, follow the sounds. And if there's a lot going on in the music, you know, maybe leave some space. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to, you know, always be about the lyrics. Sometimes songs, I've just written a song, which is out tonight, actually. Um, it's called Talk To Me. The verses like, are like two words. It's just kind of more about the space. It's a lot about um, lockdown and, well, the virus and stuff. And uh, I, I thought it was important to leave that element of space to re to reflect that kind of um, sort of em not, not emptiness or loneliness because it's not so dark, um, but just leave the the space that it needed. And then the choruses are a little bit more together and a little bit more um, upbeat and busy vocally, a bit more catchy. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm just gonna take a t look at the questions. Um, Cool, all good. And do, 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 do. there it is, notepad. Okay, cool. Um, so let's let's just write a song. Let's write a song together. Um, let's. If people have any ideas or anything as I'm going along, please feel free to drop some some notes or whatever in the comments, and I will happily address them. Um, so, the first thing that I would do writing a song. Okay, let's do this. Um, so, I, I like to whittle and play on the guitar like most of the time, and usually when a song comes, I will, I will like, play a little something and it'll come together. So, um, obviously I'm on an acoustic, so the style is going to be it's going to be a little limited right now. It's going to be a little basic. Um, but as I said, you know, like the, the production and what you do to it and how you treat it afterwards can completely turn around the sound. Um, and if perhaps maybe you're more of a rock or a blues player or something, um, maybe this might not be for you, but I'm, I'm sure there's still something that you might be able to pick up uh, on the process, whether it's to do with structure or whatever. Um, so let's just pick uh, like a progression. Something pretty basic, like, uh, I don't know, Let, let's have like a, so I usually have like a revolve, like a, a theme that just keeps repeating. So I came up with something pretty basic the other day. Well, I'm not going to do anything with it, but it's just, it's just a riff that I came up with. I've been listening to a lot of ACDC recently, so uh, it was just a bit of a, a piss take riff. So it's like... I always thought it would be great if I could um, play this with a band. That would be so cool, like an ACDC vibe. Um, so if we just have this this kind of like riff thing going on, it doesn't necessarily have to be so uh, like neutral in terms of key. If I wanted it to sound a bit more ACDC or whatever, I can just give it more fifths so I can... But if I wanted it to be a little more, I don't know, 
melancholy, I could probably just accent a few more of the, the major or minor tones. So like, so. I don't know, whatever kind of thing you're after. Uh, let's do this. Um, so we have the main riff. That's all good. Uh, as it's kind of a rock riff, I'll go with like a rock style of a tune, and I'll probably speed up a bit as well because there's a couple other things I wanted to uh, talk about. Um, so we have the main riff. We'll just call this X. I don't know, for me, if I was going to start this writing a song, it's kind of a Credence Clearwater vibe kind of thing. I think it would make sense to have some nice guitar layers at the beginning. So I would just have maybe like a little, um, like a high cut as well on the on the production software. If you just take out some high frequencies, it can sound a little bit more uh, subdued. Um, and it can add quite a nice effect when everything does come in eventually, the drums and the bass and the whatnot. Um, so we're going to call that X. So this is also going to be like a structure line as well as like uh, chord progression. So we have X. Let's just say we have X twice before the band come in. So we have something like, I don't know, maybe like almost like a build up to. We could have something like... And then I feel like that's kind of crying out for like a little melody that just sort of keeps recurring whilst we have that. And then we have like a drum fill. I think that could be, that probably would be the way I would go about it. Um, so guitar line over the top, it's always interesting to have, uh, I like guitar parts having um, sort of, almost like a little brother and sister kind of thing going on, so there's like um, two little parts working together. So the, the second part that you write for your main hook or whatever can really completely change the whole thing, because if I, if I sort of go for this kind of vibe, it's going to sound a bit more like a blues tune. But if I play more of a this, maybe it would sound a little more major. Um, I would probably try and find something that mirrors the harmony or the tonality of the main riff. So it's pretty, it's literally so basic. So we have, I could kind of. Um, I feel like John Moline would be a great person to help me with this song if he's watching. Hop on. Um, let's um, go. So, yes, I would then have drums and bass and everything else come in. So, we've got, let's just do a little bass drum for the drums. Um, I don't know, bass comes in as well. And then we have guitars, two guitars. Uh, this is a lot of cymbals. <laughs> but basically, drums, bass, guitars. And then this, we can carry on with this for like an intro. All right, and then we have a verse. So how do we write lyrics and find a melody to go over a, over a chord progression? Um, well, uh, there are a few ways. You can either think in terms of scales. So this song is, is in the key of E. So we have the minor pentatonic which kind of fits the bluesy kind of nature of the tune, I guess. Um, but you could, again, go a little bit sort of uh, away from that, and you could kind of come in a bit more major for the verses. So instead of singing... Yeah, it kind of sounds like it needs a bit of both, so it's going to be interesting. You want a little bit of minor, but a bit of major as well. And then that, the more major it sounds and the more projective, I find often the more like old town or like almost a sort of soul Motown kind of sound it has. It's just bluesy, and I think it, I think it works. Um, 
so yeah, melody. Uh, yeah, as I said, we can either think space or we can maybe follow the chords. So. I don't know, something like that. Um, <laughs> I don't really know where I'm going with this, with this song thing. Maybe it was a bit ambitious to start writing a song on online with with no with people. But um, I think I'm going to move on to my next topic. Um, okay, so <laughs> li limits. I'm going to talk a little bit about limits and um, how you should set some, but also understand that there aren't. Um, there aren't any really, but it's good to set yourself some limits, like from time to time. Um, um, oh, hey, Kieran, thanks for the question. Uh, do you ever find yourself ta taking uh, influence from other unusual genres? Um, yeah, for sure. I love like unusual music, but uh, maybe I wouldn't. In very subtle ways, so I might I might hear like some crazy guitar, like backwards guitar solo, and then put like a little. I've got a little bit of that in my in my new song, uh, which I think has made an an amazing difference to the actual the whole output like, of the song, the outcome. Sorry, um, but uh, I I think it's good just to always always be experimenting, and the best way to experiment now I think these days is. Uh, have logic, have like a production so a software, it doesn't have to be logic, it could be Pro Tools or whatever you use, um, just anything to get you sort of getting your sound from your head into, you know, into a, a real life thing. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say, you know, like figure out, like play around with like the audio, try and like reverse it. Uh, see how it sounds, whack like a bit crusher on something, put it low in the mix, see how that works. Like there's just completely endless like possibilities and things that you can do. Um, I'm just going to move on to my, I was about to say something in there, forgotten. Um, yes, limits, of course. Um, so whilst there really are none, it's also good to set yourself couple of like tasks they don't have to be in like they don't have to be for a song that you're planning to release it just means it just means you can sort of target different areas of your practice so like um, I don't know maybe today uh, next week you say oh well, this week I'm gonna I'm gonna do like an hour a day of vocal training but I'm I don't know I'm not gonna uh, sing in this style I'm gonna try and nail this kind of, I don't know, this range or in this tone. Um, I think another thing that's really important for songwriting is to, I don't know people, but showcase your ability to maneuver like through styles and, and tones. Um, like Prince is a good example or Kendrick Lamar, like uh, Kendrick Lamar, sorry, they, they have different voices for themselves. They're, they're, still, they're still doing their thing and it's still them, but they have or four or five different sounds. It's amazing. I, I saw a video quite recently of um, someone had put together all of the different vocal sounds of Kendrick throughout his album. Uh, well, the sounds that he goes for. He's got like a, a, a sort of low, quite scary, but also quite ambient. I don't know how to describe it. It's double layered. It's like left and right. And it, it's just very, when you hear it, it's very... Um, very like in in your head. I don't know how to describe it, but it's uh, the reference track is Backbeat Freestyle. If you need, if you want to check that one out, uh, there's a rap about three and a half, uh, sorry, three quarters of the way through, and that's a good example. Um, the same with Prince. He's just got different voices. He's got like a sort of slow, sexy kind of voice, and then he'll have his kind of more pop, a bit more jumpy kind of tone. And it doesn't necessarily have to be so versatile, but, but you want to be able to make people, I don't know, see a different side of you, like, through, between the verses and the choruses and stuff. Like, um, in the verses, perhaps you want to be a little bit more intimate, 
then maybe in the chorus you're a little bit more angry or something and you want to get a point across you're not quite so careful um, if that makes sense um, so yeah so setting limits is always cool um, and I'm just gonna see what else I have going on importance of new contexts I mean yeah learn learn new things all the time put yourself in different contexts um, try and play a guitar solo on one string or I don't know <laughs> you need to find there are always ways of uh, finding things that can um, uh, I don't know bring out new ideas and stuff um, Recently, I've been getting into something. It was like a Rick Graham lesson or something on YouTube. He's a he's an amazing guitarist, and he introduced this modal arpeggio thing to me. So it was like rather than just playing uh, one, well, kind of a major arpeggio, major seven arpeggio, uh, you basically just sort of shift into the mode as well. So we have. Um, F A C. I'll tell you what. You know what? I think maybe I'll maybe I'll leave this one because I haven't even explained the modes yet. Uh, okay. Yeah. No. I'm gonna leave that. Um, so <laughs> um, I I have some music out at the moment. Uh, it's on Spotify, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lesson. Um, if you want to check me out on Instagram or Spotify or anything like that, you can you can find me. Um, and uh, yeah, as I said, I have a new song out the uh, tonight. Well, at twelve, and um, yeah, I've managed to put together a music video with lots of different people, um, and it's going to be really cool. Um, and I hope that, um, that you'll enjoy it. And um, if there are any topics or anything that people want to run through or want to ask me any questions, um, you can just find me on Facebook. My name's Harry Baker. So. That's um, that's that, and um, yeah, thanks very much for listening. I hope it was somewhat helpful, um, and take care.
go hello how's it going my name is jay uh, i play band <laughs> i play band i play drums in a band called tesseract this is the first uh online drum clinic type thing that i've done um i've done drum clinics in the past i've done a couple of drum clinics in the past but this is the first online drum clinic that i've done um probably has something to do with covid uh, if i was a guessing man I'd just like to say a big thank you to Catherine, um, who's been who's put uh, put all these on and doing a great job in the background. Um, if you'd like to ask me any questions while I'm doing all of the stuff today, uh, I've got the YouTube chat up on my screen here, so you can ask me absolutely anything about anything I'm doing. 
and I'll try to give you an accurate answer. Um, what I'm going to do today, I'm going to play through some Tesseract songs. So I'm going to play through some songs and I'm going to try to link it all together with some kind of exercises um, and some techniques and some of my kind of default memorized approaches to drumming. I'm going to try and give you an insight into all those things. Um, I'm not just going to spend ages on one idea. I'm kind of going to jump around. Now, if there's something that you find particularly interesting, tell me to stop or tell me to try and go into a bit more detail. I will be checking the chat. Um, and equally, if something is terribly boring, just tell me to stop. And I will. I'll go away. Anyway, so um, that song that I just played was uh, Lament from Tesseract's first album, One. I'm going to play one more song, and then I'm going to go into some uh, some kind of the core ideas and principles that I stand by as a drummer, the things that enable me to do what I do. Um, so yeah, let's get going. This song is called uh, Luminary, and it's the first song off of Tesseract's latest record, Sonder. Let me just find it here. Uh, here we go. stop saying right after every song so I'm, I'm gonna say so instead that was uh, luminary by tesseract um, one of the more challenging songs to learn from a uh, I guess just a comfort standpoint being able to play all of the different elements in that song took me a while to get down 
And the key thing that I was weak at was, um, initially at least, was um, being able to hear, uh, feel, sorry, feel um, a couple of different numbers at the same time. And that's the first area that I'm going to get into. So that is more commonly known as a polyrhythm. If you can hear and count two numbers simultaneously. So basically it a, a number starts and finishes alongside another number at the same time. Now, if anyone here has had drum lessons with me, you can turn away now because some of this is coming straight out of my drum lesson content. Um, so what I'm going to show you, I'm going to give you a quick brief rundown of the three main polyrhythms that I use. And uh, sp then I'll tell you specifically how they relate to that song. Um, I use the 2-3 polyrhythm, uh, the 3-4 polyrhythm, and the 5-4 polyrhythm. Those are the, the three main ones that I mess around with uh, in Tesseract World. So the first one, I'm going to play it for you. It's dead easy. This is kind of the most easy one. 2 over 3. So <coughs> Sounds like that. And you can flip it round. You can put it anywhere you want. That was me just playing it across a few different limbs. So essentially what you've got going on there is uh, you've got a, I count it as a six. So I count, here I'm going to show you what I do. Uh, this little button here, puts it up on the screen. Magic, look at that. So. The way to work out any of these polyrhythms, if you can't just automatically hear them, if they don't make sense, is you can take the two numbers of the poly, in this case two and a three, multiply them, it's going to give you the grid. Um, and that grid, let's call them eighth notes for the sake of ease, uh, for the sake of ease um, you can use that grid and those numbers to calculate where everything's going to go. So literally just counting one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, if we were to, yeah, you, you, you multiply the two numbers to get the grid. I kind of missed that stage, which was important. Then to work out where the numbers are going to be placed on the grid, you use the opposite number. So if you want to work out where the threes are going to go, you use the two. So one plus two gets you to three, plus two gets you to five. So on that grid of six, you drop your drumstick. <laughs> on that grid of six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you can just keep that going. And then against that one, two, three, four, five, six, we're going to introduce the twos of the three, two polyrhythm. And to do that, we're going to work, we're going to use the three. So one plus three gets you to four, and then that loops around within the six. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four. Four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That makes sense? I think that makes sense. Get rid of my graphic. Don't need that anymore. So the first thing is to get comfortable. obviously way too fast but being able to feel it rather than count it so for me the the composites that it gives me if you combine it together it gives you a like da 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 it gives you a, a rhythm that's the easiest way of remembering it once you've got past the stage of counting past the stage of practicing it across a couple of different limbs to the stage of it just being an automatic thing in your brain then you're ready to use it now in the context of that song that i just played um there's a two three polyrhythm hiding in the intro now it's hiding throughout the song really but um being able to feel that enables me to play the three two polyrhythm between the right hand and the left foot so I've got, I'm going to do it on here because it's a bit quieter, so I'm counting twos over there, two, one, two, and over here I've got the threes, so one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's going on all the time underneath that intro section, so let me just play that intro again and you'll see what I mean. Uh, sorry, it wants to play the next song, which is not what I want. So. Here's the intro. 
follow the left foot and the right hand. That is doing a 2-3 polyrhythm. And then when we get to that next section, it goes to a, I was going to say a fairly straight hi-hat beat, but it, it's not straight because there's loads of stuff going on. But what I mean by that, w we've already introduced the count that the right hand goes to on the hats there because it's literally what the left foot was doing before. So in doing something like that, in being able to count the two and the three at the same time, you are kind of, I you're able to switch to that time or switch back to the twos. You can switch to the twos or switch to the threes. And it doesn't sound jarring if, you do if you're already playing both at the same time, in my opinion. I don't think it sounds jarring anyway. Um, and if you, if you want to be able to get to that stage where you can use both at the same time, just a little, uh, little exercise that you can do, is literally set up a metronome. Uh, you may already be able to do this, in which case you can shut off, but if you can't, set up a metronome and literally just play along. Um, let me just get to my metronome thing. So this is, what speed is this? I think it's 90. It's 90, but it's 3, 4, it's 4, 4. Uh, okay, I'll leave that for a second. Skills, okay, so. Just practice getting getting it comfortable between different hands and different limbs. You can do it between uh, split it between your limbs as well. So that's. Uh, doing the threes on the feet, but the feet were alternating. So there's all these things you can do. Um, and my advice to anyone that's trying to do anything new on the kit or any instrument is to practice the things that offer you resistance. I say this in my drum lessons all the time. Practice all the things that offer you resistance because those are the things that are going to unlock all the cool stuff that you want to be able to do. So um, literally just a simple exercise like that slow it down i, I have that uh, that's at 90 bpm but it's playing eighth notes rather than quarter notes so imagine that at half the speed um that that would be my best my recommendation for trying to get, get to grips with these things now um let me give you a couple of examples of the other polyrhythms that i use so the next one would be three over four polyrhythm so that one we're going to count like this break that down a little bit. It might be that you just got the feel of that, which is cool. It might be that you didn't. So in case you didn't, this is how you count it. We're going to do the same thing we did with the 2-3 polyrhythm, but we're going to do it to the 3-4. Multiply that 3 and the 4 together, first off. Gives you a grid of notes. It gives you 12, unless you're better at math than me and somehow it doesn't give you 12. Sure it does, though. It gives you 12. And we're going to use the 3s to calculate where the 4s are. So we're going to add 3 each time which is going to give us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So hitting the 1, 4, 7, and 10 is going to give us the 4 count. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then same as before, to work out the 3s, we're going to use the 4s. So we're going to add 4 from 1 to get us to 5, and then four again to get us to nine, which is going to be the left hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And then you put those two things together. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve.
and then obviously practice it on the feet. Any of those exercises. So practicing something like that, um, again, to a metronome, uh, any combination that's going to cause resistance, you can do alternating feet, you can do alternating hands. So. Like, literally anything. Uh, it's a not literally anything, but those are examples of three, four polyrhythms. Now, I'm going to play... Um, a song that uses uh, that uses the three four poly for me. Um, this one, um, this one's really difficult. I'm not gonna lie. This one still it causes me a lot of grief. But uh, it's one of my favourite songs to play by Tesseract. Um, it's off the second record, and it's called Exile. Now, when I hit play on this, there's no. I'm gonna have to quickly turn round because it's going to burst straight into the song, so I'm going to probably have to catch up, so give me a second. Right, here we go.
Okay. When I finish the song, I'm going to go back to a section of it and show you where that 3-4 poly is. But right now, I'm going to have a little drink of water. Because I'm parched. And once again, guys, if you've got any questions about any of the stuff, drop it in the chat. I can see the chat window. Drop it in that chat. And uh, I'll do my best to answer it after the song. I would try and do it while playing the song, but it would probably sound terrible. Both my voice and the playing. going to go for a symbol grab but I turned that functionality off when I smashed through this symbol the other week. Right so um, has anyone got any questions about that? About anything I've done so far actually not just that. Has anyone got any questions? Um, I'm going to briefly explain where the 3-4 polyrhythm is in that. You guys have probably already spotted it but in case you haven't three four poly is like towards the intro, I mean this it's in the song quite a few times, but towards the intro you've got um you've got this kind of groove, so you got that going on. 
3-4 poly. Underlying all that madness, you've got the 3-4 poly rhythm. Very basic. And between the foot and the pedal hat, you've got a 3-2 poly rhythm. So you've got a 3-2 and a 3-4 at the same time. Those are the two easiest ones to get down at the same time. If you want to, like, get some polyrhythm love going on, um, you can get to do the twos against the threes, and then you can sit the fours over there. Sorry, the fours are down there. Threes are up on the hand. So there's the two three. There's the two three and the three four polyrhythm in action in one song. Um, how um, how I've honestly learned to do any of this stuff isn't through sitting there and counting all of these numbers i've listened i've learned by listening um which is probably the most important thing i want to try and pass on in all of this is that some for some people they you need to see sheet music or read guitar tab or whatever it is whatever your instrument is you need to be able to read it or see some kind of uh chart for people like me there's a lot of music uh it like ear musicians out there people that just want to hear the music and play whatever seems right and that's literally how i've learned to do this um when i've been playing drums for let me think i was for 24 years now so a good amount of time um man i was like yeah 24 years that's terrifying that's that's actually terrifying. anyway i'm not going to go back down down that route but that's actually terrifying that's how long i've been playing drums and um for for the longest time, interesting patterns have uh, have kind of that's been what I've gravitated towards. Trying to play these more complex rhythms and throw all of this stuff in that a drummer wants to do, but make it groovy for the listener. That's kind of the important thing for me. Uh, I want someone to be able to nod their head to it to understand it, and for me. Um, I can achieve that by having an understanding of putting these different timings over one another, being able to manipulate them, and base that in something solid, like a, just a four count or a three count. And what that's going to mean is that the audience can nod along to it, which at a Tesseract concert, even though the music's quite complicated, most people are still like bobbing their heads along to it or jumping up and down or whatever. Um, and it's because there's a, there's a pulse there. There's something that's kind of very natural in the music. Unlike, um, uh, as much as I enjoy kind of more complex music, it, it doesn't please me as much to listen to that as it does to something that's kind of got a core groove to it. So um, you can bring complexity in, uh, but if you want it to, I'd say, appeal to <laughs> quite a lot of people, which isn't, that's never been Tesseract's main thing. We've never been like, oh, we're going to write this so that it appeals to millions of people. Like, it, That's never been the main thing, but grounding it and making it have a groove is very easy when you have a core understanding of these patterns. I'm just reading what is in the chat. So, what's you hit that three four groove? I'll agree. I'm honestly not sure what that means. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, yes is the answer. I'm not sure what you're asking me there. Um, okay, so there's one more pattern that i'm going to show you before i move out of polyrhythm world i said i wasn't going to spend ages in one area and i have but there's one more pattern i want to show you that i use a lot it's kind of my fall into go to oh my god what are you doing pattern um and that is a five over four polyrhythm now this one if you're not a drummer might sound stupid uh, it probably will sound stupid because it won't sound like something that makes any sense but if you are a drummer um then you should get it so Five, four. Counting a five and a four at the same time. How do we do that? How do we get there? Boom. No, that's the wrong one. That's the right one. No, it's not. No. Oh. I got the wrong one. Okay, well, I did have one of these graphics prepared, but I put the wrong one up, so... 
Can't talk about it. Um, but it's the same as the three four. You just you add the numbers together the same way. You get twenty, and then they fall onto the grid. Um, but I can't talk about it because I'm going to get the numbers wrong because it's not on the screen. Anyway, same thing. <laughs> now, with with that one, the way I actually like to use it is um, I'll kind of break it down a little bit more to <laughs> to a pattern that I can use around the kit. So the pattern that I, I use the most is going to be... Um, Right, left, left, right, left. So a five stroke roll essentially. <laughs> right, left, left, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, left, left, right, left. <laughs> it's all fives. And there's people that can go a lot faster than that. But right, left, left, right, left. That one is a great one for getting around the kit. And um, I'd like to play for you a Tesseract song that uses that 5 4 pattern. Uh, let me just get it loaded up here. It's not on Spotify. So I need to go to YouTube. It's a very old Tesseract song that was from our first record. It's a demo song called Hollow. Um, see if you can highlight, see if you can notice where the 5-4 polyrhythm is in this before I show you where it is. Clinic Marsh time. That one, um, it's a very, very early Tesseract song, that one. It was written as a intro to the set. <laughs> it was written as an intro to the set a long time ago, before we even had an album. And we released it as a demo track with one, because we had to have a demo track. Uh, sorry, a, um, a kind of a bonus track, not a demo track. Um, now, in that one, there are there's lots going on. There's flipping loads going on in that one. But 
Underlying most of it is the 5-4 polyrhythm, which again... <laughs> let me see if I can get there so it makes sense. So... So we've got fives, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So we're accenting the one and the three on the right hand. One, two, three, four, five. And we're putting a ghost note on everything else on the left hand. And then the right foot, I call these cheat beats. The right foot is just going to do uh, what the right hand is doing. Now, I'm going to bring the hi-hat in. There's your 5-4 polyrhythm. So the accented ride, ding, 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 ding. That's between the, uh, the hi-hat and that ride there. That's your 5-4 polyrhythm. And because we've introduced the, uh, the, the the hands actually counting the fours, even though that sounds weird, that sounds like it'd be the fives, right? But the, the hand is counting the fours. There's a slower count. The fives are on the hi hat, but that's where we're going to use that count to introduce where the snare is going to go, so that we get kind of a rounded groove. Because at the moment. At the moment, it, it's got no reference point. It's just a, it's just a pattern that we're repeating over and over again. So to give it a reference point, and we're going to touch on this in a longer fashion a bit later on. But um, to give it a reference point, we're going to drop that snare in. So. You can play around, you can get more complex, you can play around with instrumentation at that point. messing around but you get the idea um, wh once you've learned how to feel the five against the four then you can manipulate it then you can write some cool stuff so um, Will Knuckles how do you choose the time signatures of a polyrhythm um, this is gonna sound super cheese but they don't they choose us that honestly um, generally you're gonna choose a I mean, you can do whatever you want. You could put play a 5-4 polyrhythm over a 7-4 groove, or, you know, you could do it anywhere. But for for me and for Tess, um, it's going to be about what makes the song, what gives it feel and what gives it um, that kind of groove element I was talking about earlier where you can nod your head to it. We're not trying to write something that sounds completely crazy and mental. We're just trying to write something that sounds good in your ear holes and makes you want to nod your head to it um, and another question what goes into figuring it out so two things go into figuring it out a lot of time spent listening literally like I said earlier just listening and listening and listening and committing it to the place in your brain where you could literally hear it in your sleep like y or you can listen you can play the pattern in your brain without the music on at that stage i'm ready to sit behind a kit and when i sit behind a kit even then my body hasn't played it before so i'm a little bit rusty with it i can generally listen to a test song a new one a demo and then go to a kit and kind of play it 
even though it'll be a bit rubbish, I can kind of play it. And then at that stage, I'll just drill it. I'll play it repeated a number of times. Um, and if there's areas of it that I'm still struggling with, I'll isolate those areas. That's the best way for me to explain it. So <laughs> examples of things that I've had to isolate are like Nocturne, the... <laughs> because that's a very difficult pattern to... To, to get fast and clean, that's taken ages. Um, the Nocturne fill. That thing. I had to break down into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, I can do that. Next bit. Okay, put those together. Last bit. Ah. Add. Uh, it's just a case of building these things up and breaking them down into bite-sized chunks if, uh, if you can't do them immediately. Same with uh, Dystopia. Exactly the same kind of fill. Uh, same with cages. Uh, I can't remember the fill without playing the song, but the it, it's it's a gradual process with difficult aspects like that. But you just speed it up over time. Um, Bruce has asked, "Do I start with grooves like this for the writing process, or usually fit it around the vocal or guitar lines from the band?" So, honestly, the way most of Tesseract stuff is written is by the guitarist Ackle. He writes. 99% uh, of everything um, that you hear, uh, or at least he comes up with the grooves and then I then humanize them. So he'll send something through, I spend ages listening to it and learning it, and then um, on s on stage I'll be performing a, a my humanized version of his drum ideas. That's kind of, that's kind of how I do it. Um, there's been a couple of songs that we've written that have come from a jam situation, um, which were April, uh, which is like... <laughs> that that pattern, he'd already written that pattern as an old demo, but we, we kind of started jamming around with it and it turned into April. And the other song is Hexes, which is the second song off of uh, Polaris. That song came out of a jam situation one morning at a studio in Devon. We just started hitting things and strumming guitars and we're like, ah, cool. And then two or three weeks later, Hexes was born. Um, pretty much everything else is written. Um, the drum parts are mostly there until like before they come to me. And I'm going to touch on that in a little bit as well. So um, that anyway, that's, that's my polyrhythm segment. Um, I may have glazed over quite a bit. I'm not sure. I I that's I may have oversimplified things. I may not have simplified them enough. But to practice any of those things, isolate the polyrhythm. Stick it to a metronome. If you're going to practice a five-four metronome, stick it onto a f uh, sorry, practice a five-four polyrhythm. Stick it onto a five-four metronome. That makes the most sense. Um, hearing the fours within a five-four polyrhythm is going to be a bit difficult. But hearing the fives and then how the fours um, how they relate to that five. That gets easier over time, but literally just sit there with the two things clicking at the same time and it will start to make sense. Um, then practice it across different limbs and then start to introduce one more thing. Um, like you could start, like if I was going to give you an example with the three, four polyrhythm, the. Uh. So if I was doing something like this, I'll do this in my drum lessons, which is the only reason I've got it as an example, but three, four polyrhythm between the uh, left foot and the right hand. Just get a get little ghost note pattern going, which is just going to be dropping a one, two, three, one, two, three. So making that grid of 12 that we talked about. Anything that isn't a black note on that top line, the two, three, the five, six, this is eight, nine, and the 11, 12 is going to become a ghost note. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 
and then you can start to mess around. There's like there's so much that you can do with these once you understand them. Um, right, I'm gonna play. What am I gonna do next? Let's have a look. Have you guys got any more questions before I scroll down in my page of notes and find the next thing that I'm gonna do? I can't, my mouse isn't working on my keyboard. Um, Dan Russo, still working on that left foot, but you've been able to free up your left hand uh, and the right hand. Perhaps. Well, that's good. That's what you want to be able to do. Um, okay, so I've played a couple of Test Rat songs. Um, I'd like to show you now, after I've had a little drink of water, um, there's a couple of kind of key exercises that, uh, that kind of underlie everything that I do and enable me to, to play the way that I play. And they're very simple. They're very, very simple, and they might be boring, but I promise you, the spending time with these as a drummer, um, it it unlocks, it unlocks everything. So, um, the first one is doubles, double strokes. The amount of drummers that I've spent time with, who um, either haven't spent any time with them or think they can do them until it gets fast, and then it just sounds like a mess spend time with them so uh, what is a double stroke <laughs> a double stroke is literally hitting two times with each hand it's absolutely no effort shouldn't be effort it should be easy and to get any speed out of it you got to learn to control the dynamics and you got to learn to control how the sticks bounce in your hand now the way that i will hold my sticks tip most for most things actually there's two ways i hold my sticks i was always told not to play like this sideways because you haven't got as much movement um that, while that's true, I do kind of play sideways on the ride, so I don't stick to that rule completely, but um, I use like a finger technique where it's very loose. You can kind of see my hand there. Stick's very loose. It's not touching my palm. It's literally resting in the bottom of my fingers, in the crease of my fingers there, and I've just got a little bit of pressure between the, uh, the thumb and the index finger to control the bounce there. Most of the control and most of the stick movement is coming from my middle finger there. That's the one that's got the, p uh, the control and the power. Same with the left hand. So when I'm doing doubles, if I isolate it and think about it, my hands are very, very loose there. Very loose. But as I start to go faster, the, con the, key, the control comes from that middle finger. And if, I'm, if I literally isolate, I'm holding it there. Like, that's where I'm holding it. That might look weird. <laughs> my, <laughs> my hand doesn't look like that when I'm playing. Obviously, the other fingers are wrapped around. But that's where my middle finger is uh, is kind of holding and controlling the bounce of that stick. And there's a little bit more tension the faster I go. That's the only difference in my hands, though. You try and do that with your index fingers and thumb. And it just sounds like... It sounds like one of those marching snare rolls. Like it's a different thing. It's not as defined and it's not as clear. You haven't got as much control. You can use your index finger and thumb to um, to steady the stick, but not. I'm not gripping there for any for uh, any reason when I'm playing those doubles. Now, uh, just a a double exercise that I recommend. Um, so that you're not just playing, you can play it on a pad, obviously. 
but I'd recommend uh, if you sat behind the kit, um, moving around the kit because you've got to if you want to be able to use it um, in anywhere other than the snare drum, you you want to be able to move with them. That's a very important thing to be able to do. So I would recommend eat just a simple exercise where you're playing one a set of doubles around the kit. And then when you get to that end, you start to come back around the kit, but from the left. So you go right around the kit, leading with the right, and then left around the kit, leading with the left, and then back to the starting point. So I'll play it slow, and then I'll explain what's going on. So. So we're playing four, 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 six, one, two, three, four, five, six. So we end up starting with the right again. And then after that six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Right, right, left, left, 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 right, right, left, left. So you're still doing doubles. Nothing about the hand pattern changes, but the the what the s the sonic difference is that it sounds like you're leading with your left, and it kind of feels as though you are, even though you're not changing the um, you're not changing the leading hand. You're just moving it back around the kit. But that's a nice exercise, and if you've got more toms. Like <laughs> Just practice, add that extra tom, and if you've got three toms. You've got two toms, like literally just three on each. Um, but just practice moving around the kit with doubles. That's going to unlock quite a lot, especially when you consider that most of the most of the work that I'm doing with, um, with ghost notes is either a single or a double. And like... <laughs> I have to be able to go from a ghost note into an accent and only through having the control there that I talked about a minute ago can I get the kind of ghost note into a, into an accent. So doubles are super important. Um, lost my mouth. Let me see what the next thing is that I'd written down that I was going to talk about. Um, the... Oh, yeah, okay. So this one's cool. A kick drum technique that I want to talk about very quickly is uh, something that I use a lot. It's kind of the, the only thing that I can do that's really fancy with my feet. Um, and it's not even that fancy, it's just like a, a standard thing. But the heel toe kick technique, which looks like this. So I. To achieve a double on my feet, or specifically my right foot, because I don't do it with my left ever. Just slowing it down. You can see the first hit comes from the back of my foot there. That's why it's called heel toe. There. And that enables me to play. Um, like, let's say I wanted to do a double pattern. Uh, where it sounds like double kick you could go uh, you could play it a different way which sometimes makes it e makes the groove easier to play um, but I'll, I'll talk about that later but you can it, it just as an exercise like a heel toe exercise you can practice something as simple as that so instead of playing straight doubles you can Just heel, toe, right, right, left, right, right, left. Um, 
that I use a lot in Tesseract. And you've tried learning this technique for such a long time, but you can't get it, says Jack. Jack, okay, so let me go back to the kick pedal. Watch this. Both pedals are on the on the beta, on the head, right? Watch what happens when I take them off. Why do you reckon that is? The tension on the right pedal is properly high. It's like it's set so that I uh, the, the beta gets pulled away from the head really quick. In contrast to that, the left pedal, it's super loose. You can see the spring. Like, look at the difference in the length of the spring, even when they're, they're not... Um, when the pedals are, are away from, when the beat is away from the head, the tension on that left pedal is literally, it's about as loose as it can go, because my left leg, um, I, it's my weaker leg for a start, and all I'm having to do is drop it down for like double kick stuff occasionally. So if you're struggling with your right foot, first of all, I'd say stick the tension up on the pedal. Raise maybe the height of the pedal, of the, um, Raise the height the height of that up a little bit so that because it, it might just be that it's too flat. If if it's if the spring tension is up but it's too flat, you're not going to be able to do heel toe effectively. It could be that you got giant feet and that you need to get a longboard pedal. That can be something. I mean, that's not something I've witnessed myself because I've got like size nine feet or something. Um, but um, another technique that I can recommend, just an exercise, is literally just isolating like. Just something as simple as that that's going to cause you to do the doubles for, for in, in, in like a straight succession like that. Um, and there's an example of a Tesseract song that does that. Um, singularity, which I'll play for you in a second. So heel toe, I use that all the time. Um, practice that if you haven't, because that's a real good one. There's, there's other techniques you can do, depending on what you want to achieve. Uh, there's like the swivel technique that I haven't practiced because I'm not trying to go <laughs> on the kick. Um, there's, I don't know, there's other ones, but heel toe for me is really useful. And I've seen drummers get it down with both feet, uh, and then you can play very fast. You can play super fast kick fairly effortlessly, because when you haven't, when that's not hard to do then then you're good and you can use it in fills like like to be able to free it up and not not use both feet means you can carry on the metronome with your left foot so let's play a song that features some uh, some heel toe let's see so this is a song Tesseract used to play this live. We haven't played it in ages. Um, it's off of... What's it off of? Altered State. It's the final song. And it's heel-toe-tastic.
Christ. <laughs>
go. So, I'll play the outro just because it's lovely. So the next section of the clinic, I'm going to talk about creativity a little bit. didn't trigger at the end. How annoying. Okay, so that's uh, Singularity into Embers. Um, we've never played Embers live, actually. We've never played all of Singularity live, but we should do one day. So that all I wanted to do there with that song really is show you an example of a Tesseract song where I'm using quite a bit of heel toe. Now... The last section, I'm going to talk to you about um, a few creative techniques that you can use to just a get yourself out of musical black holes because you know what it's like as a musician. You you're trying to write something. Uh, like where do you start, or how do you take something that you already know and make it better, or uh, any combination of things. Just the that kind of dark corner that you go into when you're just like, oh my god, none of my ideas are good. What do I do? How do I get out of this? Well, a couple of things you can do. Um, there's something that I like to do where, and it's going to sound like the most stupid nonsense answer, but I promise you it's going to make sense, is to start simple. Like, literally start simple. Um, and Let's say, how, how am I going to like... Th okay, I'm gonna, let's think of an example. Um, Tesseract Concealing Fate Part 2 and 3, right? I I hope you know that. I can play those two in a second, but there's a, there's a, there's a beat in that song, in Concealing Fate Part 2, that um, it goes like this. I'll just play you the beat. So... Um, So there's a lot going on there with the kicks, um, but essentially, like once you've learned the pattern that's going on there, it's fairly simple. It's just <laughs> one, two, three, four, with a gent kick drum pattern following the guitar line. Now, there's a section in that song where we wanted to change it up slightly, and it's like, okay, what can we do to that beat to make it more interesting? Um, to make it different. Now, there's any you can do absolutely anything to it, but you might go down a black hole of like, well, uh, I don't know what I can do. What? How can I possibly change it? But literally, the best question to ask yourself in those situations, or the best thing you can do, in my opinion, literally just change one thing about it. So, with that beat in particular. <laughs> I'm going to change one thing, and it's a pretty big thing. I'm going to take my left foot out of the equation. So my left foot isn't going to be playing on the double kick. 
So. That then means I can either do heel toe, which I'm probably going to have to do to get those, uh, get some of those kick patterns in. Um, but what I'm actually going to do, I'm going to make one more simple change. And this is just going to be a blanket rule across that entire groove, right? Every time, it previously there was three on the kick. Every time, there because there's only ever t one, two, or three. Every time there was a three, I'm going to change it so that it's kick, kick, snare. Every single time. One, two, three becomes kick, kick, snare. One, two is going to become kick, snare instead. So, uh, and single kicks are just going to remain as kicks. But, um, so twos become kick, snare. Threes become kick, kick, snare. So I'm going to use that heel toe thing. Now, my left leg isn't on that pedal anymore. So I'm going to stick it back over on my pedal hat. And what that does is it gives me my, my metronome. It gives me my kind of mental grid. So I'll play the two beats and I'll play what happens if you apply that one rule, literally one rule, to the same groove. At this stage, we could do um, we could start playing around with the instrumentation. So that's one more rule. It's just about changing one thing each time, and that's really that's that's the best rule that you can that you can apply if you're getting stuck. Uh, you can change a a straight pattern to a triplet pattern. You can, if you've learned the three four poly that we were talking about earlier, you can start hitting the threes of that three four instead of the fours. If you've learned the five four, you can start hitting the fives. If you uh, th there's just so many things, but you can just change one thing. Um, let's let's see. I'm sure I've got some more examples that I can show you here. So, um, in fact, would you? Shall I play? It's up to you guys, because I can I can play Concealing Fate Part Two and Three, or I can give you um, kind of a more detailed uh, pattern example. In fact, there's a couple of songs that have pattern examples. Let's see if anyone responds in the chat first. If not, I've actually got a cool exercise that I might go into instead. Okay, what I'm going to do, here's what I'm going to do. Um, I've got a, there's a pattern that I've taught, I haven't taught it to everyone in my drum lessons, but I've taught it to some people. And this this is like an another example of what you can do with then the same detail. So okay, here's some details. Um, this is going to be an example of how you can take a a longer pattern and repeat it over a four count or a uh, just like a, a straight count that's going to make sense to everyone else. And this is a way that you can start to write grooves. The example I'm going to use is uh, it's going to be a pattern, like a nine pattern. And what I want you to do in your head, literally just count to nine, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We're not accenting anything at the moment. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think we can all agree that we can all count to nine, right? <laughs> That's it. That's the whole thing. Bye. No, it's not the whole thing. So counting to nine. So change one thing. Cool. Let's uh, accent the one. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four. Three, four. Okay. We can all do that, right? One, two, three. And you might even get to a stage where you don't have to count, you can just feel it. Then, let's add in the four as well. One, uh, one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. So we can do that. We can do it without thinking about it. Let's. Add one more thing. Let's add in the six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One. <laughs> I feel like I'm being led into war. <laughs> okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Like. Now you feel like you're being led into war. Maybe if you're an orc army, you're being led into war with this. speed it up that's the next thing so we're gonna get comfortable just bouncing it like okay not thinking about it just it's now just a think next simple thing we're gonna put a hi-hat count in there okay going to do it's going to make it loop every 18 so we've got nine at the moment but because we're doing one two three four five six seven eight nine one two three four five, so it's on the odd numbers then the even numbers one two three four five six seven eight nine one two three four five six seven eight nine uh you're actually going to give nine counts on the on the pedal hat Okay, that's the first simple thing. Let's change it to the kick instead. So instead of it being on there, we're just going to put it on the kick. We're going to go... Okay, now it's down there. Let's do... We could bring in a ride pattern, or we could we could actually this is probably a bit bit more interesting and maybe more relevant to Tess. We could do ghost notes on everything that isn't um, a kick. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, we got that down. That's fairly straightforward. Not having to think about that. Then let's uh, let's turn it into something a bit more interesting. In fact, let me show you guys what's going on. Uh, uh, no, I won't do that first. I'll do. Um, let's bring in a snare. So we're going to start putting a snare accent in there. So. So what this is going to give us is um, I'm putting a snare accent against a one, two, three, four over here. If we're turning that nine count into a four, 
I'm turn I'm putting the four against the nine basically, and I'm putting the, the snare on the three. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Against that nine pattern that we're doing. What that looks like is that. Get in. Oh, see that's put the uh, nine pattern over the top of it, but that don't matter. So. Um, actually, no, it hasn't. I'm just looking at something weird. I can't. I'm, I'm messing it up here. So, here we've got the. Uh, you can see the nine bars that we're going to play, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, seven, eight, nine. The bigger numbers. The little numbers on the bottom show you the uh, the eighth notes, where um, we're going to count that nine against the uh, against the bar, and. When you're counting those nines, the we've got the black dots representing the accents, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Each time, essentially, it's displacing forwards by one eighth note, which means the nine goes over the bar, then the eight nine goes over the bar, then the seven eight nine goes over the bar, then the six seven eight nine goes over the bar on bar five. So all of that's happening so that at the end of bar nine, it all wraps up and comes back around. So try and count along um to this you've got one th uh, bar one one two three four five six seven eight two three four five six seven eight nine so that's that that was me hitting those black dots. That I, I could have just written music for this, but I chose to make a graphic instead because I'm a plum. Um, but those black dots basically represent where the kick drums are that I just played. So and everything else in between, or um, well most of the things in between, where there's there's just a line, I would turn into a ghost note. And what I'm going to do is put a snare on the one, two, three of a hi hat count against that, and I'm just going to put the um, I'm just going to do like a straight kind of half time beat on the stack so I can show you what that sounds like. But we've turned it out of a simple nine count into a one, a four, and a six. And now we're going to play it against the four. So. Let's say once we've got that down, because that's a nice groove. Um, what else can we do? Let's go back to our rule of creative rule. Let's uh, let's change one thing. Um, instead of playing the quarter notes, we're going to play dotted quarter notes. So um, we're going to add two more beats. Uh, actually, no. Last time we were playing like half notes, so we're going to bring it back. We're going to reduce two beats. So instead of being like. Let's pretend that's the first beat. Instead of the beat that I played, we're going to um, add two notes to that. So one, two, three, four. one, two, three, one, two, three. We're going to do like threes over it instead of fours. Let's take that away so you can see. So you can see, again, change instrumentation, put accents on every other one. Uh, you could do dotted eights, like. Ah, I don't know if I can even do that.
<laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, I'd never do that. But y- you can do, again, you can apply all these things. You can just change one thing each time and it can evolve into something cool. And which leads me to the final point that I want to make, which is you can have these ideas and not be able to play them. <laughs> which is 100% the point because you want to learn you want to learn something that you can't do. So if you've got these ideas but you can't play them you can use a computer that's what we have them for. So um as I said earlier most of the Tesseract ideas are written on computer first and it's a guitarist with an immense amount of groove I might add but it's a guitarist writing parts for a drummer. And these are loops generally there's like a, an underlying loop that is let's say an odd number for the sake of, because they usually are odd numbers, um, 15, 17, 23, something stupid. And it loops. Uh, um, and the only way to kind of learn that is by copying and pasting it. So write something, doesn't matter what the accents are, just decide what the accents are. Change them later, change them to groove more if it feels like um, a different pattern's going to groove more. But just start out with something, with anything. Copy and paste that kick drum pattern. Um, and then put your four count over it or put your three count over it start from there and if it's too difficult to play initially then have the computer play it back to you that's the wonder of using these machines is that we can literally program this idea in or play it in using one of these kits uh, quantize it so it's played perfectly on the beat listen to a metronome speed it up slow it down just use the technology that we've got to enable you to learn and write the beats that are within you that you haven't unlocked yet and then some of the exercises i've shown you th- that today uh, use those exercises to get to the stage where you can automatically play those things rather than relying on a computer um so yes there we go there's some stuff from my brain and from my drums into your ear rolls and eyeballs let me see um i can play us out i was going to play considering fate part um two and three but i think what i might do is play my favorite ridiculously difficult tesseract song and then if you guys have got any questions at the end we'll do a bit of a q and a um if you haven't don't worry you don't need to have any questions but if you do i'm happy to try and answer them so here we go this is uh nocturne with outro here we go
right, ladies and gents, have a think. Any questions at all about touring, being in a band, drums, um, life advice? <laughs> I'll try my best to answer it. go ladies and gents. Right, I'm going to give you a second to uh, ask any questions. How much am I looking forward to m touring and meeting Trivium on the road? Asks Ben Hurst. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It's been a mad year of not touring for bands and I'm sure uh, you'll all appreciate the music industry is kind of in tatters at the moment. Um, when last February, March time, every band that was on the road, every tour manager, every merch guy, every lighting engineer, bus driver, you name it, guitar techs, drum techs, stage techs, anyone that wor works in venues, including Catherine that's put the um, this clinic on, um, these people are basically out of a job this year because the the support from the uh from various governments hasn't been great for the creative sector um so this year has hurt quite a bit um from a <laughs> financial standpoint let's say being a musician um and i'm just looking forward to next year hopefully things getting a little bit back to normal they may not until the end of the year which is why that tour is scheduled for the end of the year but we're kind of hopeful that with with about a year of COVID vaccines going out, the, the world will reopen a little bit. And going back to the original question, I think um, uh, I'm really looking forward to that tour. It's going to be amazing. So for those who haven't seen, uh, my band Tesseract is going out on the road with uh, Trivium, Heaven Shall Burn, uh, then Us, and then um, Fit for an Autopsy. It's quite a metal tour. Um but we're hitting up, uh, it's it's Europe as far as I know. I haven't seen any information about other stuff, or at least nothing that I can announce yet. Um, but I, I'd hope that 
that tour will go ahead. We're supposed to be going to South America in March next year, but I would say if I was a betting person, I'd say that probably will get postponed again. I'm not saying it is postponed because at the moment it's on, but I don't know if the world will be okay enough for us to all get together and go to South America. Um, I don't know. But, um, yeah, it's going to be great. I'm really looking forward to it. Jack Bryant, do I have any drum books that you can recommend? And can I be your drum tech, please? <laughs> uh, I don't read music, so I don't have any drum books that I can recommend. Um, I, I had a few a few drum lessons when I was in school. Mainly, I went to a religious school. Well, it wasn't a religious school. It was a Church of England school. But my drum lessons aligned perfectly with the weekly of religious education lessons. So I managed to go, yoink, I'll have drum lessons, please. Um, so... Yeah, there was that. Um, I, I, other than that, I haven't had any experience with drum music. Although I've learnt to write it, but I just can't read it. <laughs> it's no, it's no, of no use being in front of me while I'm playing music, but it is of use uh, if I, I can chart things out. So at the moment, I'm working on Nocturne, which is uh, six pages in at the moment. I've just got the outro to write. Um, that'll be up on my website fairly soon. Um, but I don't have any actual drum books that I can recommend, which I apologise for. But um, I mean, you can have lessons with me if you want. I do drum lessons. And you can... Um, what else is there? There's a guy called Dave Ellick whose drum lesson I haven't done, but it comes highly recommended. It's a course called Getting Out of Your Own Way. Um, a lot of drummers recommend that, so that might be worth doing. Um, in fact, Jack Bryan that asked that, I'm pretty sure you do have drum lessons with me. Or have had. I'm being a plum, I can't remember. Uh, Kieran, what the actual heck... Um, is going on in the Nocturne outro. You can never seem to count it. Exactly the same. Let me just answer that and then I'll um, I'll go. So what the actual heck is going on in the Nocturne outro? So in the intro, let me, because this is, it all relates. In the intro, you got four bars of seven. You got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, let me just play it and then you'll get it. So um, back to the start. I'll count it for you. Oh, come on, computer, you can do it. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So, four bars of seven. At least that's how I count it. But I'm not counting in real life, it's just sevens. Then. Against that, you've got a one, two, three, 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 which means playing against that against the seven, um, you when it comes back around, the triplets are on the three. So one, two, three, one instead of the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, they end up being on the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three against the seven, and then the second time, the third time round, if we were to play it a third time, it'd be on the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. So that same stack pattern over the intro is happening over the outro. You've got the um, one, two, three. It, it sounds crazy because the snare isn't just straight, but it's it's a straight. Um, it's a straight count on the s on the snare. It's just a pattern that you have to kind of learn. It's just a repeating pattern. It's repeating sevens. Um, and the h the crash thing that's going on up there is um, I I is changing in the same way that the intro is changing. I haven't tell you what. When I've written out the uh, the tab for Nocturne, Kieran, I will send you that section, and you could go. Oh, I still don't understand. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> Hopefully that'll that'll make some sense because I haven't I haven't charted it all out yet. But um, I'm also n I'm not counting sevens at all. I'm just counting like a one, two, three, four over the whole thing. And the trick is to not think about it. If you don't think about it, it's a lot easier. I promise you. But to get to the stage where you're not thinking about it, you have to have listened to it a lot and practiced it. So the my actual answer is there is no shortcuts. You just have to be a legend and learn it. <laughs> ben Hurst, I've been counted to six. Well, you counted it wrong, mate. 100% counting it wrong. I had a message from a guy the other day who said, um, you're wrong, Jay. 
it's it's because I posted a little clip of it on the internet showing the seven four, and he was like, "It's not that. It's one two three one two three. And he counted it. He sent me a video. I sent him a video of me going one two three four five six seven. He sent me a video of him going one two three. It doesn't matter what it is, as long as you can, um, as long as you can count it. It's whatever it ma- whatever it is to you that makes sense. Um, but if it doesn't make sense, then it's seven. <laughs> <laughs> I am right. <laughs> the internet is wrong. So anyway. Unless there's any more questions, um, Catherine has said, thank you very much, Jay. That was an incredibly instructional and very much appreciated. Um, where people can find me and my lessons and Twitch and things like that. Okay, so I sh- do lots of live streaming on Twitch. I am, as you can see from all of this setup, I stream on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Monday to Fridays, it's 10 a.m. Central Time, which is 4 p.m. in the UK. Saturdays, it's 2 p.m which is um, 8 p.m. in the UK. Um, it's twitch.tv forward slash J Tesseract. It used to be J Postones. It's now J Tesseract on Twitch. Um, you can find me there. You can get me on Instagram, which is J Postones on Instagram. Uh, those are the only two I really use. Um, I am on Facebook, but I don't use Facebook. I am on Twitter, but I don't use Twitter other than to moan at a company that's given me a bad product occasionally and look like an ass. So... Um. yeah that's it thank you for your questions thank you for your attention thank you Catherine for putting this on I hope um, everyone has enjoyed it and um, tell me when to stop streaming <laughs> I don't want to just abruptly end the stream I'll do a little dance how about that tell you what let's put this on to end things bring it on no, not that. This. There you go. 